Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started because I have, um, I know your time is precious. I have a lot, probably too many slides um, as I normally do to get through. Um, my name is Dr. Jamie Furr. I'm the director of the Selected Mutism and Brave Bunch program at FIU Center for Children and Families. So it's so nice to see so many people um, here. Um, I'm also the clinical director of our mental health and interventions and technology program. So I do a lot of the clinical training and supervision um, of our doctoral students and uh, master level students coming through the, the center. So um, obviously I'm gonna be talking about treating social anxiety and selective mutism in, in young children. Um, and before I get started, um, just to try to get a sense of who I have in the room, um, cause it'll help me kind of know where to, to sway my talk a little more than others. Um, so, and I know some of you, so it's nice to have some lovely faces here. Um, how many of you are teachers? None, okay. How, how about um, social worker, psychologist, doing direct clinical work with kids? Okay, that's the majority of you. And another professional? Clinical supervisor. Supervisor, okay, doing supervision, okay, great. Well, welcome. Um, please feel free um, to stop me and ask questions as they come up. Um, it'll be more pertinent and it's probably what some other person wants to ask as well. So please feel free to, to ask um, as we go along. I, if there's something that I know I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, I'll just let you know that we'll get to it in a minute and we'll come back to it, okay? Um, and again, all of the slides, you guys should be getting emailed the slides, um, so. If for some reason it didn't work because I have a lot of videos embedded, just let me know, okay? Okay, so who we are at the CCF, you guys have probably heard a little bit about this throughout the conference, but obviously we're located in, in Miami. Um, we're not located, sadly, on at this campus staring at the beach um, in the water. We're in West Miami-Dade, um, where it's a much more kind of uh, lower SES, kind of minority population, um, and that really are the, the, that's really the population that we provide treatment to. So obviously all of our ev treatments are based in an evidence base. And um, am I doing that with me, no. myself? Okay. Um, I didn't wear the, quite the right outfit for the microphone. Um, so, and obviously everything that we try to do, we try to base things in research so that we can collect evidence to know, does this really work or, or does it not? And obviously the rest of it is, is about educating upcoming doctoral students, master level students, undergraduates, clinicians in the field. And so it's really helpful to, to kind of have these conferences where we can all get together and, and kind of trade ideas and such. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is um, going over kind of definitions of selective mutism, just in case some of you are unfamiliar with it. Um, the influence of language, obviously given where we are located in Miami, it's important for us to consider this. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about the Brave Bunch treatment and I'll be talking about kind of each different treatment component that we use, um, as well as um, kind of some of our initial results and then tell you kind of where we're headed next. So um, in terms of the objectives, hopefully you'll be able to understand our, our behavioral therapeutic model for treating SM, learn and hopefully role play some ver verbal directed interaction skills, which are kind of the crux of uh, the skills. And if you saw Cheryl McNeil's talk, um, it's actually a good precursor to, to my talk because um, it's based kind of in a behavioral theory as well as PCIT um, modes, and then hopefully you'll be able to identify some, some steps that you can take in a, in a hierarchy uh, for treating kids with SM. So how many of you have seen a child with SM? Awesome, most of you. And how many of you have provided treatment for that child? Okay. So, um, so, <laughs> I'm getting distracted. Um, so, no, it's all right. So, um, so fear, let's talk a little bit about where kind of selective mutism is sort of stemming from. So um, finally in DSM-5, it was classified as an anxiety disorder in which there's a lack of communication or speech in a, in a social situation. Oftentimes that is within the school setting. Um, it's not better accounted for by pervasive developmental disorders or autism spectrum disorders or kind of the primary issue isn't like a language problem um, or a language disorder. So to help put into context sort of SM and, and sort of where, you know, my model of anxiety, obviously um, raise your hand if you've ever felt nervous or afraid about something. 
Yes, all of us, right? So it's normal, we need it, it's necessary. We actually have to have it in order to do our daily jobs, right? Like I probably wouldn't get to work on time if I didn't feel somewhat anxious about making sure that I'm you know, complying and getting there when I need to. And so we actually need it to, to survive from real and actual danger. Um, so what it's designed to, kind of back from the caveman days, is to really design to draw our attention to real threat, to real danger, so that if the, the alarm is going off in your brain that something is gonna hurt you, then you are aware of that. So if I'm walking along and like a bus is coming and I see that, I'm like, that's dangerous. My alarm goes off and my system, my fight or flight system kicks me back out so that I get out of the way, right? If I didn't have that, I would just be run over by the bus, okay? So we need it. But what can happen is that over time, it can become too sensitive. So that all of a sudden the alarm is going off when somebody is talking to me, if I'm a kid with SM, somebody asking me a question, all of a sudden my fire alarm is going off rather than if, let's you know, instead if the lion was in here eating me for lunch. Does that make sense? Okay. So in terms of the prevalence of anxiety disorders in general, um, they're actually one of the most common um, pediatric disorders that we have in kids. And so um, anywhere between 10 and 20%, um, you know, some of the studies vary in terms of what the prevalence rates are, um, but it's, pretty rel it's relatively stable over time. It does not remit typically without treatment, um, and it can actually lead to later substance abuse problems, depression, and further anxiety disorders in kind of um, late adolescence and, and early adulthood. So it's really important that if, um, especially for these kids, that we get them in and we get them in early and start working with their families as early as we possibly can. What we find, um, and I didn't put this up here, but what we're finding is that there's actually quite a significant delay between when the problem is actually sort of recognized um, or even noticed to when they're actually seeking treatment. And unfortunately, we're trying to, we want to try to lessen that gap between when a teacher might say, hey, you know, I'm noticing something's going on to when the parents actually seek treatment. So obviously the selective mutism, this is the diagnosis from, uh, from the DSM-5. And um, so again, it used to be classified as a childhood disorder. And so now it's actually more appropriately placed, in my view, in, within the anxiety disorder section. Um, and so it makes a bit more sense when you're talking to families about where, where this stems from. And so obviously like any other disorder, it has to cause interference, it has to get in the way of their functioning, of their having friends and um, uh, kind of an appropriate uh, kind of family life at home. And one thing that's extremely relevant to people who work kind of within the school setting is that we, we do not diagnose this if it's only happening within the first month of school. So why do you think that is? Yeah, it's normal, exactly. It is normal. All right, and I enjoy behavioral reinforcement, so I hope you're all ready for some candy, and I'm gonna not throw it at you, even though I was going to. So just like with the kids that we work with on a daily basis, if you use your words and you use your voice in here, you're gonna get candy, it's awesome. All right, so, um, so we don't diagnose it within the first month of school because everybody gets nervous or afraid in that first month of school. Um, even if you see it for the first like couple of months, um, I rarely see those kids. Normally the kids that present to us at our center are those kids who have had this behavior going on for one to two years, as I mentioned before, where typically the parents are like, nah, and the pediatrician says, just wait, you might grow out of it, they're shy, don't worry about it, they'll, you know, I'm sure they'll, it'll be fine. Um, and so these are the kids that we see, where they waited for, through kindergarten, they waited through first grade, and now they're in second grade, and now the teacher has no way of assessing this child's academic um, abilities, or, you know, they have no idea what they're learning, okay? So those are the kids that we typically see. Um, rarely is it secondary to a traumatic event. So there used to be a lot of um, kind of talk that the, these kids must have experienced some type of trauma um, for this type of behavior to onset. And what we know now is that that actually is not the case. It's actually the minority of cases um, actually have a trauma in their history. So I'm not saying that it never happens. I'm just saying it's a much rarer case in, in our experience that the majority of these cases have sort of a genetic predisposition. There's often anxiety laying somewhere in the family tree. So there's anxiety kind of being 
genetically kind of trans, transmit, uh, transmitted, but as well as sort of being modeled probably in the home, sort of that anxious avoidant behavior. And what we also tend to see is that it's pretty stable over time, um, meaning that it's not going to sort of like wax and wane, um, like you might see for some other disorders, but that like once they sort of have this kind of trajectory, they're, they're going to stay on that unless they have treatment. So um, the, typically when we see it, uh, again, the typical age of onset is around five to, to six, and we think that the onset is probably earlier than that. It's just that when they actually present to treatment and you can document what age they, um, what age they came to treatment, then it's typically around five or six. So let me explain a little bit about how we kind of understand SM and sort of this negative cycle um, of avoidant behavior and negative reinforcement, okay? Because this will sort of put everything into, into hopefully an understanding of kind of how, how I view SM as well as anxiety in, in general. So obviously you've got a, um, can you see that? That's bad coloring, okay. So the child is prompted to, um, is prompted to speak. So you're there with their parent and they're, they run into a friend at the grocery store. Hi, sweetie, how are you? So what do you think the child does? Remember I got candy. <laughs> yeah, you just want candy, I know it. Uh, looks down and hides behind Yeah, exactly, they retreat. They hide, they avoid. They go and stand right behind their parent and look down like I am not doing this at all. Don't even think about it, okay? So the child gets overly anxious and the child avoids, okay? So what ends up happening next is sort of our, is gonna be a key thing, and I realize really you can't see that at all, I'm sorry, um, is that the adult jumps in and rescues, okay? And we do that for a number of reasons, right? So I'm a parent, I have two little kids, um, and when somebody asks them something and they look a little nervous, like I'm probably quick to be like, oh no, no, it's fine, like she's, she's six now. Um, yeah, come on Delia, say hi. And um, she doesn't really like to do that. Um, so we jump in, we get uncomfortable because our anxiety is going up. The kids are not speaking, it's awkward, they're gonna think my child is rude. Um, so the parent is having a lot of kind of thoughts about what the situation is gonna unfold into. And nobody really likes awkward silence. So they jump in and rescue, Oops, sorry. So what ends up happening, unfortunately, is that everybody feels better, right? So the parent jumps in, everybody's anxiety goes down, so the child feels better, whew, I don't have to answer that question, mom just did it for me, and the parent's anxiety goes down because now there's no more awkward silence, everybody is content, everybody got what they, what they needed from the conversation. Except for the fact that this now negatively reinforces the avoidant behavior. Because it feels really good in the short term, that I now got out of that situation and I don't have to feel anxious. Unfortunately, over the long term, it causes that anxiety to be maintained. They've now learned avoidance make it, makes it better, and if I have to do it, then that's just gonna be really uncomfortable and I don't wanna do that, okay? So for everything that we feel afraid of, um, you know, the cognitive behavioral model is gonna teach you, really, you need to just go towards it. You gotta approach those situations instead. So what can happen over time, unfortunately, is that we kind of, uh, what, what we're terming more is like, people can become contaminated. People, settings, places, um, groups of people, they can become contaminated, meaning that there is a history of established kind of behavior of not speaking, not verbalizing with somebody in that setting. Typically that happens within the school setting. Um, and so you can, it's, it's varied. Right? So we have some SM kids who will only speak to the teacher and they won't speak to their friends. We have other kids who will speak to their peers but they won't speak to any of the adult staff or their teacher. Um, we have, I've really seen kind of a range of different presentations. Um, and so with obviously the majority of it being in school, whereas some people are fine everywhere except like the second they hit the parking lot of their school and then they stop. So oftentimes there's pretty clear like perimeters around where they speak and where they do not speak. And sometimes that doesn't make any logical sense to us. It may make perfect sense to the child, but it doesn't make sense to us, okay? So, but we have to know that like once it's a contaminated person, place, or thing, then it's gonna likely make that a harder time for them to engage with that person 
on a, on a comfortable basis. What we do see though, is that these kids are pretty typically chatty at home. Um, they are not socially inhibited in the home environment, or they have to be able to be comfortable speaking in some particular setting. Most of the time that's within the home environment, which makes it different than sort of, I know some of you were in Susan White's talk with autism, but that makes it different, right? So we need to know they have verbalization at home, they're comfortable speaking, there's not a language disorder that's totally impairing their ability to speak. They have been verbal before in other situations. So we want to know that those things exist, okay? Um, does that make sense why we would need that? Okay. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're able to kind of get them at a place where we don't have that history of being contaminated. We're not in that relationship with them yet. Right? So we're still the good on the good team, like where we're not sort of people that they have where we've asked them a question and they haven't answered us, and now there's this expectation that that's sort of what's gonna happen when they're in the room with us, okay? So what's really interesting is that although the anxiety disorders across the board are very common in kids, SM is actually relatively rare in comparison. So some of the literature shows that it happens in less than 1% of the population, um, which is very small uh, when you think about the number of cases that were kind of showing up in epi epidemiological studies. Um, we do find that it's more common in girls than in boys. Um, but what we're also finding, um, and this is, oh, I guess I mentioned that before. So the age of onset is between two and five. Um, and what, what I find interesting is that there is a pretty high comorbidity um, with anxiety disorders, with other anxiety disorders. So as probably most of you know, like the anxiety disorders all kind of hang together. Um, and if you have one, you're actually more likely to have two or three rather than just one. So there's pretty high comorbidity. So obviously social, um, the, the SP up there at the top is social phobia. Um, and there's a very high overlap between social phobia and SM. And initially when it was in the DSM-4, and obviously we don't have enough data yet now for with DSM-5, but within DSM-4, you could double count the symptoms because you had, um, because the disorder was not in the anxiety disorders section, it was within the childhood disorder section. Um, so you could kind of say, well, the lack of speaking, they're doing that, and they could have these other social anxiety symptoms. But even within the DSM-5, we're still finding that we have a very high rate of social anxiety in addition. Um, but that there actually are those kids where they only have SM. They don't have that social anxiety component where they may not be speaking, but they sure look like they are having the time of their life when they're playing, they're having fun. Um, and even the teachers are just like, I never realized they were never saying anything because they look like they were just really enjoying themselves, okay? So um, the next highest is separation anxiety, simple phobias. Um, we do see sort of a, um, a small percentage of kids who have an overlap with uh, or have comorbid oppositional defiant disorder. And again, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of talk, well, these kids are just being stubborn. They just don't wanna answer you. They're just being oppositional. Um, and although we do find those kids, again, um, more often than not, do we find that they have, that they're more on the anxious side of things rather than just like, I'm just digging my heels in and I'm not talking to you, okay? Um, because it, it, it's gonna affect how you treat them going forward. So sometimes we have to kind of demyth, um, demystify that for the teachers that like, they're not just trying to be a pain, you know, um, they're really extremely, extremely anxious and they're not able to engage in the behavior. And then we do see some, some kids with ADHD. So within our sample specifically, you can see that obviously they all had SM, um, but that about 80 to 81% of them had comorbid social phobia. So you can see that that's a pretty, the highest rate all the way through um, enuresis. So obviously being down here in Miami, so I was at Boston University for three years. I was in the Northeast for a longer period of time. Um, and when I got down here to Miami about three and a half years ago, uh, the number of kids who were coming in with SM behavior and social anxiety was going through the roof. Like, and it didn't really, I hadn't experienced that because it is such a rare disorder that for I mean, we were just getting numbers and numbers. And um, so, you know, when I, 
when, once I took a step back from that, I realized that being down here in Miami in, in such a place that has so many different languages being spoken, and in particular language, different languages being spoken in the home than what they have to do in school, that there is very much kind of these splits on, on, um, on sort of your, your majority language and your minority language and, and kind of who you kind of associate your language with within your, within your home as well as in school. And so all kids who are learning a new language have a typical silent period, which is about six months. So when they're learning a new language, so if for, for example, if a child just moved here um, and they were learning English for the first time, you're also not going to diagnose them with SM if they can't speak in English to somebody at school. That is normal. Sometimes it even extends a little bit beyond the six months. So again, I'm not typically looking at those kids. I typically get the kids who have been here or they grew up here. They primarily speak Spanish in the home. They do have to speak English at school and it's been around that. We know that they can speak English, um, but they're still um, not able to do so in the school environment. So we wanted to try to understand that a little bit more to try to help guide sort of our treatment approaches as well as just to understand kind of what, what's making them sort of um, kind of at higher risk for developing selective mutism because again, not all kids are gonna develop that even though they speak multiple languages. So um, what we do find in some of the prior research is that if they are, um, if they are bilingual, that they're actually kind of overrepresented, that you can see here that like the numbers range anywhere from like 10% up to 39% which is a whole lot more than like you're less than 1% of the population, right? So it is, you know, almost 10 to 40 times more than what you were seeing in your general population if they are bilingual children or have multiple languages. So um, obviously we need to learn more about this. So, um, and so what we were trying to find out is really kind of if they are monolingual, if they're multilingual at home, um, we kind of classified it as one of the two um, and tried to find out sort of how they felt about their language or their parent felt about their language um, and whether it fell into the majority status or the minority status. So the kids who spoke primarily English were considered within the majority status. Um, and so you can see here that um, we obviously had a, more people within the majority status, um, but you can see we were almost at an even split here in terms of the, their multilingual status. Um, but obviously we have a, a pretty high rate of um, Hispanics, almost equivalent to the non-Hispanics. And so for those of you who are familiar with the larger research in general, that oftentimes things are happening kind of in ivory towers, you get a very high percentage rate of Caucasian families and very few minority families. So for us to be down here and, and really be able to kind of access these populations is, is exciting because then we, I can understand more about how best to approach their treatment because it may be different than what we're doing with other kids. So as you can see, um, the only difference that we found um, was actually within um, the majority and minority status and within the school environment. So what that means is that if they were a part of um, if they had a minority status in their language, then they were more likely to exhibit SM behaviors and higher rates on their SMQ, which is the Selective Mutism Questionnaire, than kids who were in the language majority. Does that make sense? Um, whereas if they just spoke one or two languages or three languages, that did not make a difference. So it's really about how they are kind of associating themselves with the majority or with the minority. Um, and that, that being within the minority language group, they are really kind of showing reduced speaking. So it, it kind of helps us understand um, a little bit more, but we have, we have a lot further to go. So we've collected a lot more data and hopefully we'll be able to uh, put something out there into the literature very soon. Um, yes, ma'am. Right. Unfortunately, um, our, our numbers are small. So our goal is that over this past summer, and sadly I'm realizing it's February and I have not analyzed this data yet, that, um, that our num we got a lot bigger number over this past summer, but we're collecting probably at least an N of 60 this summer. So we're going to wait and try to combine all of the data so that we have a big enough sample size to look at that difference. Because right now it's we, have, we didn't have very many people. What was your question? Oh, um, 
was there a site difference between New York and Miami in these, in these data? Um, and my answer is basically I don't know yet, um, just because I want to have a, a bigger sample size in order to really test it. Um, Asking a question, I didn't know. Yeah, you raised your hand and everything. Um, thank you for asking your question. Um, okay, so any other questions about this? Um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about sort of the crux of what I do primarily is the Brave Bunch program. And so what we know in terms of data for treating kids with selective mutism, um, Unfortunately, it pales in comparison to all of the data that's been collected on doing cognitive behavioral therapy for other anxiety disorders. So social anxiety disorder, um, generalized anxiety, separation anxiety, even OCD when it was an anxiety disorder, all of those anxiety disorders have a, like, a plethora of trials that you can look towards. Unfortunately, kids with SM, because it was so rare, um, they're very underrepresented in those larger RCTs. and um, so there have really only been um, two to three tri RCTs or randomized control trials now on a treatment for kids with SM specifically. So there are some kids with SM within those larger trials of the coping cat, of, within CAMS, if you guys are familiar with the research literature. But um, luckily, over the last couple of years, um, there have been a, a couple, a few more. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about those in comparison to what we're, what we're trying to do now. So Lindsay Bergman um, was the first one to publish sort of a, an actual treatment manual for children with, um, with SM. And hers is an integrated behavioral therapy program um, that runs for um, 24 weeks. And she compared that to a 12-week waitlist control and found that the behavioral treatment um, includes typically like shaping behaviors, uh, reinforcement, fading. Um, so much more behavioral than the, and for some of you who are with Susan White yesterday where your C is really small, um, the C is really small with these kids, right? So if you think about um, kind of where you have to start is really with the behavioral treatment component and doing shaping and, and reinforcement, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so the kids who were in the treatment um, condition showed an increase um, in their functional speech production, um, and 75% of them were responders in comparison to waitlist, which is a pretty great number. In addition, Oerbeck and colleagues um, had a trial come out and an additional follow-up in 2014 um, where she, so Lindsay Bergman's model, everything is done in the office. Um, there's letters that get sent to the school. They, they're conducting different exposures. Oerbeck and colleagues went straight to the home environment first. They, they skipped the office altogether and then went into the kindergarten setting. And so, and again, you can see, like even Lindsay's, let me go back up. Hold on. No. How do I go back? Oh, I didn't give you her N. She had like an N of, I think, 24. And Oerbeck and colleagues, you can see it's like six out of seven kids. So you're, these N's are like incredibly small. Um, so kind of taking that and going, yes, that's a, a study that we should you know, really make sure that everybody knows about. I, I, I respect it because it's an RCT, but you have seven kids in the trial. You really need more kids than that in order to really understand how is this going to generalize to the, the population at large. Um, but what she found is after 14 weeks of treatment that these kids were doing very well. Um, so you can see here that um, in public, um, they kind of had the lower, the kind of lower skills, but you can see in their kindergarten classroom, and again, the Selective Mutism Questionnaire um, has three sections of um, kind of assessment, so school, community, and home, and it assesses how frequently they're speaking in those settings with different peers and adults. So you can see that in, with, in kindergarten, they got their numbers very high. Um, so three is like the, is the max. Um, so on average, they were doing very well there, very well in the home. Um, you can see, though, in public, because they focus less on the public setting and the community settings, you can see that that's lacking a little bit, right? But overall, very good findings for their, their program. But again, it's still taking them 
Um, theirs was 14 weeks. We have uh, the other trial that was 24 weeks. Um, and so what's happening is that most of the time, people who are in treatment are taking anywhere between three months, even up to a year, um, to have uh, <laughs> to see effect. And so obviously these families, if you think about like you're a kid who is not um, speaking in school, you need that treatment to be pretty quick, right? So um, even waiting for six months is, is a long time to wait to see success. So, um, so what we wanted to do um, is to really try out these more intensive treatments that we have found to be very effective for panic disorder, for um, OCD, uh, specific phobias, those treatments have all been shown to be very well treated with an intensive format, meaning that you've got multiple hours of treatment on multiple days in a row um, so that there's sort of kind of a carryover effect from the learning that they had on day one to day two and, and so forth. So um, Brave Buddies uh, was developed at um, New York University, at NYU um, by Dr. Steve Kurtz, um, who I had done my uh, internship and postdoc with at NYU. Um, he's now at, uh, at um, Kurtz Psychology Associates. Um, and so the, he really, in 2009, we did the first kind of go at, at Brave Buddies, is what it was called. And um, I think we had nine kids, maybe. Um, and so what has happened over time is that this has now been replicated in even in a number of sites across the country. In Chicago, there's like three in New York. Um, there's a small one happening in California. And if you're interested, I can definitely get you um, a list of where they're happening now. Um, I took it to Boston when I went to Boston and said, we need to do this here. And then when I came to Miami, um, there was not much happening here. Um, Vera Jaffe's up in Coral Springs, but down in Miami proper, there was not much going on. Um, or if you had seen a case, it was like one in 30 cases that you had seen before. So, um, so we wanted to sort of adapt this model to work for this population here in Miami. So it's called, um, we changed it. Brave Buddies is actually trademarked, so I'm not allowed to call it Brave Buddies. Um, so we're brave bunch. That's I'm probably stealing something by doing that. Um, so uh, what I do have some data on is sort of a case series that we have um, from the camps that we ran um, last summer. Um, and so I can I'm going to describe this, but then what I'm going to get into more is sort of like the crux of what we did during that treatment so that you guys can practice some of these skills. Um, you're going to get good at using these skills so that hopefully you can take those back with you um, when you leave here. So um, we had 26 kids in, in our program. Um, we had obviously more girls than boys all had a principal diagnosis of um, of SM and the CSR just means their severity rating. So it means like how severe is it on a scale from zero to eight using the, using the ATIS. So we were still using the ATIS-4 at the time. Um, and then the parents also completed the SMQ and the SCARED um, and a whole host of other stuff that I won't um, bore you with today, but um, uh, at pre and post um, and then later on as well. Um, so the, the selective mutism questionnaire is a, is a good screener. It's 17 items. Um, like I said before, it does give you um, information about the school, the home, and community settings about, so it asks questions like, my child um, talks to peers in the school setting, and then it's from never up to always, so that you have kind of a sense of how often they're doing that. Um, I don't think it's so time sensitive, so for our intensive, format, um, what I'll show you later is we've created some more behavioral data um, and observation data that we use to, to really try to understand sort of the changes that are happening because um, it's, it's just not as sensitive as I would like it to be. Um, the scared you can also use um, and we uh, use what we, oh, I didn't change that. So we have, we use a behavioral observation um, measure in the beginning when all kids come into the program. So we do the ATIS, we get some uh, self-report questionnaires, parent report questionnaires, and then we also use um, what we call the SMICS, or the Selective Mutism Interaction Coding System, um, which we have kind of 
which Kurtz and colleagues sort of took after the DPIX, for those of you who are familiar with that from PCIT, um, where you give the parents sort of tasks to do behind a one-way mirror. So um, for these kids, it's really helpful to have the one-way mirror because we're not present in the room. So we're not affecting sort of how they're speaking, hopefully, with their family. So it's a little bit more representative of what it might look like at home. Um, again, we know they're still in a clinic setting, so it still could be different. But our hope is that it's as close to normal as we can get it to be, um, being in the center. So they actually, um, the parents, we've now extended it. Um, so I'll tell you the extended version. Um, so the parent and child are in the room. They're playing with toys just like they would during like the DPIX, during your play, the CDI time. And um, the parent has the bug in the ear and we have the parent play typically for five minutes and then we start to have them ask different kinds of questions um, to see how does the child respond to those questions. Are they verbal? Are they barely audible? Are they not responsive? Um, um, are they you know, attending to what is going on in the play at all? Um, and so, and we also want to see sort of the style of parent um, questioning, right? So are they doing sort of this rapid fire, I'm asking you 600 questions within a minute, um, or are they letting the child have sort of an opportunity to respond? So we have them do that process twice. At the end of that time that the parent's asking questions, we send a stranger or confederate into the room, um, and that, that person sits there for 10 minutes. Um, they don't play with the child, they don't interact with the child, they're just sort of sitting on the side doing some work. And then um, we have the parent do the same exact thing as they did in the first phase to see how does it change their, their responding. Um, sometimes we get kids just stop talking altogether, so they're completely non-communicative during that time. Some kids actually will still respond, but they're very quiet, or they are like only speaking like in mom's ear. And then you have other kids who like they're totally they're talking normally, um, but they're very aware of that person sitting in the room. Um, so we have the stranger ask the child a question at the end of each of those um, to see whether they're able to respond to that as well. We've we've since extended it to see sort of how are these kids separating and how are they doing with um, sort of a compliance task because what we were noticing is that we would get kids coming in to be uh, who were eligible for the camp um, whose parents denied any separation problems, any oppositional problems during the ATIS, um, and then they would come in for treatment and this kid is full blown like suction cup to their parent will not leave after you know five hours of treatment with them trying to get them out the door um, and so we really needed to know like what is their actual response to um, their parent leaving the room um, as well as their parent telling them to clean up the toys yes Yeah, so you were asking how long it takes for the parent to typically to be able to leave the room. Um, so, yes, uh, so I have different answers based on sort of what we're doing. So within the assessment, what we do is that the, basically we have a stranger come into the room. Um, the parent says, I have to leave for a minute to talk to Dr. Fur. Um, so and so is going to come right into the room and draw with you. And then we see what happens, right? So we only allow that process to go on for like two minutes because um, we don't necessarily want to torture the child and, and make them sort of, um, and not torture because obviously they should be able to separate eventually, but we want to see what happens in that process. Can they calm themselves? Do they cry initially, but they calm down after 30 seconds? Does it take, are they in full blown panic for two minutes? Um, if, if that's the case, then we quickly send the parent back in. Again, we don't want to establish like a new negative pattern of behavior in our center. We need it to be like, we are the greatest place in the world for you to come. Um, so sometimes we get kids leaving fine. Typically with the reason we are trying to see it so fast um, is for camp, when they come into these intensive treatment programs in the summer, we have a very short window to get these kids ready to basically be separated from their parent all day, right? So we need to see, can they do that or are they not able to do that? And so we, it's, we have, uh, everybody gets at least two kind of lead-in sessions or fade-in sessions is what we call them to see if we can get them ready. And so that's one of the criteria is that we, we can get them at least separated for a period of time from their parent. Um, but that almost becomes one of our first goals for these kids. Whereas like in our standard treatment, I'm okay if like the parent is in there for a little while, right? Because I want to coach the parent and help them understand. But I also want to 
get mom or dad out of the room to try to help establish a new way of sort of being and presenting in the world, that you're going out there and you're going to be speaking. And oftentimes, there's a very well-established pattern of behavior with their parent. So even after we're in treatment with the kids for a while, we'll have, we need to get mom out of the room and then go around separately with the child doing exposures. And then oftentimes, we'll bring the mom back and actually have them lead the exposure so that we can see what does the child do as well as coach the parent live in how to run the exposure to kind of help reconnect that, um, kind of redo that pattern of behavior. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Okay. And thank you for asking a question. You get candy? I feel like I need to run. All right, I'm throwing. Everybody ready for throwing? Okay. I played softball, so hopefully I'm on target. Um, Okay, so any questions about assessment? Okay, so um, this is what we were just starting to get into. So it was a great, you, you knew exactly where I was headed with my talk, so thank you. Um, so, so for the camp, and again, this is different than sort of the individualized treatment, but all of the sort of components are the same. Um, with individual treatment, we're able to just move a little bit slower, whereas in the intensive treatment, we're moving, we're moving pretty fast to try to make sure that we can get these kids ready. Um, but we also think that the intensive format is something actually um, helpful to them because um, they're they start to make gains, they're pretty slow to warm, right, as most of these anxious kids are. And then once we get them going, our hope is that if we can keep them doing like a million and a half practices over and over and over again, then we're going to make more, more gains more quickly. So the parents are brought in for um, a teach session um, where we educate them around anxiety, around what SM is, um, how it gets negatively reinforced. So we try to provide that information to them. And in addition to being able to separate from their parents, we also um, require that they speak to at least two counselors um, prior to being able to enter the camp. So typically these families come for um, about a week and a half or so. Some come for two weeks where, um, where we're able to do the lead-in sessions and hopefully get them speaking to us pretty quickly. Um, and then hopefully they're able to, to go into the camp. Um, we've had a couple, I would say very, very rare, um, a few kids where we're not successful in getting them ready for camp. Um, so uh, it's, it is not 100% um, you know, foolproof. Uh, it's very hard on us when that's the case because um, we want them all to be successful, but some kids just aren't ready yet to, to move forward or there's another diagnosis that is getting in the way of us being able to kind of really work on the SM behavior. Oftentimes that's separation difficulties or oppositional defiant disorder is also in the mix. Um, and if that's the case, then we treat the ODD first and then we work on the separation or the, or the selective mutism. Um, so the way we have designed our classroom is that we have two head counselors per classroom and then we also have a teacher who knows the exact schedule of the day. They know exactly what, what the, and they've all been trained to mastery of the skill sets that you're going to learn in a minute. Um, and so we had two class, we had three classrooms, two where they were the younger age and then we had one older classroom, kids ages eight to 10. So we typically take kids from three to 10. Um, and each camp sort of varies in terms of who you get and, and what age range, but we do try to separate them on a smaller age range just so that we can do more structured activities that are fitting for their developmental level. So throughout the course of the treatment, they're really getting, um, it runs from nine to three each day, Monday to Friday, and then the kids are also in sort of aftercare from three to five, where it's less intensive treatment, but they're still surrounded by counselors who know the skills, but they're, we bring in the siblings, um, they're all in there together, um, they can play games, they can kind of do whatever they want. Um, so it's a little less focus on sort of producing speech. Um, and while they're doing that, the parents are in parent training. So the parents get two hours of parent training every day, um, as well as sort of a live coaching session with us within the camp setting. So we do this camp um, as a part of the larger summer treatment program that Dr. Pelham runs here over at Paul Bell Middle School for kids with ADHD and disruptive behavior problems. Um, we go, we kind of drop in for a couple weeks um, and then we leave. <laughs> so uh, ours are only one week camps, um, but we, we take them over to the middle school so that they're with the rest of the, those kids. Yes. Yes. Yep. Is there also sort of the other, the disciplinary component as well, or is it just mostly the 
Um, there is some discussion of the disciplinary. Um, sorry, you were asking if the, um, is it all, is the parent training relationship building in addition to discipline strategies, right? I got your question right? Okay. So um, it's, it is some of both. It's um, primarily sort of the, the CDI or the relationship building, kind of boosting up the, the nature of the relationship. Um, in addition to teaching some more what we call verbal directed interaction skills, which is, or VDI, which are the skills that are gonna teach people how, the parents basically how to ask questions and how to respond if they don't answer. And then we have, um, we also have uh, some discussion of kind of setting up a reward system for appropriate behavior. And so really we say that that can kind of be extrapolated not only for um, speech behavior, but also for compliance, for other things. But I don't, we don't teach PDI specifically. For those families that we have, or timeout sequence discipline strategies, we don't teach that specifically unless we are, in the assessment we have seen that the ODD is pretty strong, and then we will recommend that we work on the, um, the limit setting and discipline setting first, or disciplinary action kind of first, and then they enroll in the SM treatment. What we have found is that those kids who have pretty significant ODD are much less able to kind of go with the system with, uh, and are much less motivated to make change in, in our treatment. So we've had a lot more difficulty getting them to progress um, to being able to participate in the camp. Did I answer your question? Okay, all right, I'm a little worried about throwing it this far, but I'm gonna try it. All right, I'm gonna throw it to you, nice catch. Thank you for your question. So these are just some of the typical activities that we engage in. So throughout the course of the day, we try to set it up as, as much as possible like a regular school day because this is where the kids are having the most difficulty in their life and we really want this to transfer over. So the more similar you make your treatment, the better transfer of gains you're gonna have. So they, they have centers, which is basically free play in the morning for about 30 minutes. And this allows them to warm up. Um, we're using all sort of child directed um, kind of good play therapy skills, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then we do a morning meeting. Again, a lot of preschools and even kindergartners have their meetings in the morning where they talk about their jobs and the weather and what day it is and all of that. So we, we try to incorporate that as well. Um, and then every single game and activity that is designed within the program is really used to help promote verbalization, social skills, um, initiation, not just being able to respond, but having to approach somebody else within individually, within small groups. And then we also have them go into the lunchroom, as you can see, oh, I'm showing something. We have them go into the regular lunchroom with all of the other kids. Um, we don't do it on day one. Um, day one, they get to eat um, with just their class. And then over the course of the week, we start to expose them to more challenging situations verbally as well as socially. So we have, if you can imagine, we have basically two ends of the continuum um, in, a in a lunchroom where we've got kids who have ADHD and disruptive problems, and we have kids who have SM in the same room trying to interact with each other. So it kind of teaches the ADHD kids how to inhibit themselves, they have to wait, and these kids are taking an excessively long time to respond. Um, so it's kind of good for both of them because those ADHD kids are gonna be the kids that they might see are more typical in their classroom than like a kid who's nice and quiet and wait, patiently waiting for them to respond, right? So we wanted them to have that exposure and I actually think being in the middle, in the classroom setting and being in a school environment where there's other kids around is a really helpful component of our program um, that I didn't have before when we were just running it like at our center at FIU, right? Because even though there's people around, you're not around a bunch of kids um, and that's more of what they're gonna get in their everyday school setting. So we also have incorporated what we call bravery lessons. So each, each day they get taught a skill and that varies depending upon their age. So the older classroom is gonna get, and we'll talk through what those bravery lessons are in a minute, um, but very briefly, typically it's like, we teach them about doing relaxation or mindfulness exercises in one day. And then the next day they get um, kind of detective thinking or cognitive restructuring components. Um, we teach them problem solving and then they have to practice using those skills in different situations um, on the coming days. So we're trying to give the kids some toolbox that they can take home with them also. Um, so we have started to incorporate more of the C back into the treatment with the older children. Um, and I 
that that in particular is I don't think happening at all of the camps or all of these sorts of intensive programs. Um, but given you know my my base training was with Phil Kendall and doing the coping cat, and that's where you know that my that theory really drives how I treat kids with anxiety. And so I felt like it was important to give them something. And so even for the younger kids, we have modified it to teach them different tools that they can use even at three and four. Um, did I go over everything? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I've talked about all of that. So, um, oh, in addition, we provide a teacher training um, online as well as in person if they want to come. So we have, we have them recorded, but we also hold it online so that if people, the teachers, because we have a lot of people who come from out of state. Um, I think 20 out of 26 families over this past summer were from out of town. We had several from out of the country, and we had more, a majority of them from out of state. Um, again, these treatments are very hard to find, unfortunately, and the middle of the country is sort of lacking except up in Chicago and Michigan. And then there's only one over in Chicago. So we basically took like the whole Southeast corridor and are bringing most of these families over to us, at least giving them some resource um, and, and hopefully sending them back out with, with something. Did you have a question? Yes, so we do offer, um, you were asking if we offer the teacher training for people outside of that, yes. So we have a link um, that I can send to all of you. Of, it's me, so you're, it's, it's a lot of what you're gonna learn right now. Um, so you might, you'll be bored if you watch it again, but um, it, it's basically me going through like a two hour talk, um, teaching the same skills, helping the teachers understand. Um, and then we do provide school consultations for the families who are enrolled in our program. We do provide um, a one-hour school consult specifically with their teachers so that we can help get those kids up to, to speed because we recommend very specific things to do prior to them starting school each year and even in the middle of school depending on when it is. So yeah, great question. Are you ready? All right. Good effort. All right. Okay, so what does treatment look like? This is the, this is the good stuff. Okay. Uh, we were very uh, lucky and humbled. Uh, we got the New York Times to come um, in 2015 to uh, kind of take pictures and, and write about um, our program. Um, and uh, it's really exciting because I think, you know, it really got the word out to uh, the rest of the country and the world that like SM exists and that there are treatments for it and that we can do something about it, um, but that we need more resources for it because um, there's just not enough people doing doing the treatment. Yes. I just have a quick question. I'm sorry. Are nope. Stupid, but Nothing is stupid in here. Every question is good. Okay. And, um, is selective just SM and the ICD-10? Yes. Okay. It's F94. That's the code. All right, all right. Does anybody need her candy? All right. I'm sorry, I'm getting hot. Um, I was so cold in that other room before that now it's sweating. OK. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about anxiety, because this is sort of how we go into working with the family. So do you remember that negative reinforcement cycle? So I, be, I basically take that cycle, and I explain that whole system to the parents in this teach session. I want them to understand the fight or flight system, the fight or flight response that happens. Um, and I explain that very explicitly, that like I need it, but right now, that anxiety is getting in the way of them being able to do things, to be able to function academically and socially. Most of the time, their social skills are pretty lacking, because they've also just had a utter kind of lack of being in those social interactions. So they're much well less versed on how to have a conversation, how to have reciprocity in their conversation. Not to the extent of some autistic children, but sometimes they're, it's pretty lacking. Um, so we also want them to understand what happens with anxiety, that and kind of riding the wave of anxiety, which um, Donna Pincus has a panic manual called that specifically, but it's a really nice kind of visual for families to think about how, um, kind of what happens with anxiety. I'm trying to figure out if like, That's not our audio. I think that's what is that? With, uh, the PA oh, okay. So should I not do anything with? No. Okay. All right, I'm going to keep going. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so 
riding the wave of anxiety is, is an important factor for, I think, everybody to understand um, because it helps people know that like, if they go into these anxious situations that they, um, they are likely not going to die, that they will survive, that they are okay, that they can tolerate it, even though it may feel like utter crap, they can tolerate it and they can deal with it, okay? It's distress tolerance, basically, is what this tells you, okay? Um, but it's easy for kids to understand and for families to understand as well that like, if you are going into a situation, your anxiety is gonna go up, it's not going to feel so good, right? And if you jump out of that situation right at that moment that you start to feel anxious and it drops down to here, what do you think happens the next time you go into that situation? Yeah, it does, it's high, it goes right back up. It goes up. Exactly. Who, who, you just answered. You get a lollipop. You get more candy. Ah! You don't have candy yet, right? You have candy? Okay. Hopefully everybody gets candy by the time we're done. That means you all have to participate, okay? So, um, so it actually can go right back up and it may even go higher. Right? So that's how the anxiety gets maintained over the long term, unfortunately. Whereas if they actually stay in the situation long enough, then their anxiety, for the most part, should start to come down. It plateaus for a little while, and then it should start to drift off. That doesn't always happen, um, but it can. And for the most part, it should start to kind of taper off and come back down. It doesn't mean that it's like the next time they go in the situation, it's not going to go up at all. It's going to go up, but it may not go up as high or it, go, it may go up and it may come down faster. Okay, does that make sense? Did you need me? Okay. Um, so any questions about the, the wave? So we want them to learn to ride the wave of anxiety all the way out until hopefully that anxiety has come down rather than avoiding it when that anxiety peaks. Okay? So um, just like uh, Dr. McNeil was talking about PCIT and CDI, we also use child-directed interaction skills um, to first promote sort of that positive relationship. So just like with oppositional kids, you can really start to get kind of a negative coercive cycle of uh, inter an interaction between the parent and the child related to SM behavior, right? So if you think about um, the kids who are anxious and they're hiding um, and their parent is like, come on, you're supposed to say something. This is so embarrassing. Why aren't you talking to them? You should be answering them. And it may not be as like angry as that, but it can get pretty uncomfortable for, for them going back and forth because they're not doing what their parent really wants them to do. So it can create sort of this negative interaction. So what we want to do is increase sort of the positive attention to those appropriate behaviors, right? So just like with oppositional behavior and you're, you're attending to their, you know, walking kindly and using safe hands and using nice words, like you're doing the same thing within this treatment, um, but you're also going to start to focus on some different behaviors um, than, let's say, compliance. So we use label praises, reflections, and descriptions. Um, so we basically steal the pride skills from PCIT. Okay, so how many of you are familiar with PCIT and the pride skills? Okay, so um, I am going to go through them, the, at least the specific ones that we target, um, and then we can, um, for some of you, we can definitely talk more if, if need be. Um, so a label praise is a positive statement about what the child is doing. And typically you want that to be about an appropriate behavior. But what it does um, most importantly is that it's very specific about the behavior that you like, um, about what they're doing, right? So good job, that's great, you're awesome, you rock. Those aren't bad, those are great things, right? You want to kind of increase the positive attention altogether, but you really want to get specific about the thing you like. The more specific you are, and the more you use those label praises for that behavior, you will see the frequency of that behavior increase. Perfect, right? We need verbalization to increase. So the more we actually praise their participation, thanks for answering, thanks for telling me what you wanted, thanks for using your words, thank you for looking at me when I was talking to you. All of those things are going to start to increase their, their social behaviors as well as their verbalization. Any questions about label praises? In addition, we do use the reflection. And some of this actually came from, um, I know she mentioned it with the kids with autism, but there was a PCIT trial in kids with um, kind of high functioning ASD. And, um, and we saw that there was an increase within that, um, that article and even with like a, a 
a particular case of mine, um, we saw that the, the rate of verbalization and the amount of verbal interaction increased just due to CDI. Um, and so you see that even within the populations who don't have SM. And so this is, it's pretty exciting that even just by using your positive attention skills in a slightly different way, that you can really increase the amount of, of speech that you're getting. So um, the reflections are basically a statement that paraphrases or repeats back what the child just said to you. So you're thinking, these kids are SM. They don't tell you anything. Um, well, not to their parent. Not to their parent maybe in front of somebody else. Not to me once I become like a, a person that I'm, I, once I'm in their speaking circle, then they will speak to me. And the more you actually reflect them, then the more they're actually going to see, that you're, you'll see that behavior increase as well. It also allows you to, um, to kind of clarify if you're not quite sure what they're saying, because sometimes they talk really, they're barely removing their lips and you can't understand what is coming out of there, but you know like, oh, something's coming out. So I think you just told me that you wanted to do this. Thanks so much for telling me that. So we basically repeat back what they said and then we give them a label praise right after it because it's like, kind of like my one-two punch, right? Like you're excited that they have responded, so um, you're gonna give them that label praise. I should note that some kids um, find label praise or praise sort of toxic to them. Um, so you can just sort of see them like, ugh, like what are you doing? Um, so for those kids, we try to be a little bit more understated. And again, these kids are socially anxious. They don't like that to be the center of attention. They don't want it on them. So I much, uh, I kind of tone it down a little bit for them. Um, you can probably tell I can get a little excited, but I, I try to t tone it down for, for those kids. So, hey, nice job telling me what you wanted. That's so cool that you just did that for me. Um, that's great that you just told them. So I lower my voice a little bit. I try to make it a little bit more direct to them rather than like, hey, great job answering me from way over here. Like, I may do that if we eventually need to get to that goal, but for, at the beginning, we're not, we're not going to do that, okay? Um, any questions about the... Reflections, okay, we're gonna practice those in a minute. Um, and then we also use behavior descriptions. Um, and these are, are um, another one of the key skills that you, that you want to use um, and what we teach teachers how to use as well. Um, and we teach teachers the same exact thing, okay? Um, so basically the, in typical CDI you're gonna be just like you would. You're gonna be describing the, their play, what they're doing, almost as a sportscaster. So like, um, I like basketball. So, oh, he's dribbling down the court, he pulls the ball up for a layup, he takes the shot. So you're describing that moment by moment play, right? What is observable behavior? So you do the same exact thing for kids who have SM within sort of the first CDI portion of, of our treatment, where you're basically describing what they're doing in their play. Oh, you're moving the truck along, now you're driving it up the hill, and now you're driving it down the hill. So you're doing that moment by moment play, okay? When it comes to, when we shift into teaching uh, verbal directed interaction, we use the behavior descriptions in a slightly different way, and we also use them when kids give you nonverbal modes of communication, okay? now. For all of you who have worked with a kid who, ha who has SM, or who has had SM, how many of them were really, really good at using their nonverbal communication? Extremely good, right? So, so to the point sometimes where they're mouthing things and people are like, no, no, he's fully talking. And you're like, mm, nope, there's nothing coming out of there. <laughs> so um, they're really good at it, and they have to be, right? Because that's their only way of getting their needs met. And we want them to learn they can use words in order to get the their basic needs met, and we're not gonna rely on the nonverbals. We all rely on nonverbals. You're shaking your head, that tells me you understand what I'm talking about. Um, so we all use that, but they heavily, heavily rely on nonverbal communication, and so we want them to learn that there are these other ways of doing so, and they know that there's other ways, but to get more comfortable using them and less anxious about having to use them. Okay, does that make sense? So we, we merely describe the nonverbal behavior. So, oh, I see you're nodding. Not I see you nodding yes, or shaking your head no, I see you nodding. So I'm not going to mind read, I'm not going to interpret what she is telling me, even though I all know, we all know this is yes, I, I can't interpret what she is t trying to tell me. Does that make sense? Okay. That is, I think, one of the harder skills to pick up on, and it takes time. And you get better at recognizing like how fast they are at their nonverbals, and you get faster at picking up on it and going, oh, I see you nodding. Hmm. 
So instead of like, oh, I see, oh, the answer is three. Thanks for letting me know that the answer is three. No, nope, I didn't say anything. Okay, so, oh, I see you're holding up numbers. You're holding up fingers, that's it. So not you're holding up three. Oh, I see you're, you have three fingers in the air. Does that make sense? Okay. So in terms of CDI, what you're gonna do is really, just like standard CDI, you're gonna let the child lead the play. You basically are becoming a good play therapist in that moment. Um, but you're also going to actively ignore any inappropriate behavior, just like you would in PCIT, uh, where you're not going to give positive attention or any attention to an inappropriate behavior. So, um, you know, if they're crashing the cars when you're playing or they're like, they start to, oh, I don't want that, uh, you know, or they may not say anything, but... Um, kind of showing inappropriate behavior, we're gonna actively ignore that quickly and then hopefully come right back to the play when they start being appropriate and giving them a big label praise for being appropriate, okay? So that's in your more standard PCIT stuff. Um, we avoid any questions, criticisms, and commands during CDI time, okay? So what we want them to do is warm up. We want them to settle into being with us. We don't want to come off right away asking them 100 questions and telling them to do a bunch of things because they're not going to do it and they're not going to want to continue to talk to you, right? And that's our goal. So we got to get them comfortable, settled in, so we play with them. Um, we're on the floor with them. We're excited. We try to bring in things that they like to do um, and eventually a good number of them will start to speak sort of on their own, um, but we, we have other specific methods that I'll show you in a minute. Did you have a question? Yes, now I have no idea if I can restate your question, but no, because it it's a very good question. Um, so if they're holding up the number, if, if I'm holding up fingers, is it also important for us to know, do they actually know that? But really the, the point is to make a space for them to be able to, to verbalize. Yeah, yes, you are exactly right. So ultimately, if you, if you know that they know what this is, like if they're, four, five, six, seven, developmentally. developmentally appropriate that you know that they know what this is, then you can ask them, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. We'll talk about VDI in a minute, where um, it's specific questioning that pairs with those behavior descriptions, so that you're saying, I see you holding up fingers. How many fingers do you have up? Yeah. What, what, what number is that? Um, what are you trying to tell me? So that you're prompting them in a, initially to start doing it and then over time very it's really fascinating how fast it happens and you guys can probably attest to this like the set within probably the first session I'm like oh I see you nodding they're like yes like they learn very fast that like it's not an acceptable response in some ways to us for kids who are completely non-communicative so that means like in the setting they're just they're frozen solid I may start with nonverbals moving up to mouthing, moving up to syllables, moving up to words. Okay. So it's not to say you can't ever use nonverbals that they're like, oh, an atrocity. It's not that. It's just for a lot of these kids, they're starting with like the nonverbals and you sort of start with where they're at and move them forward. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Great question. You ready to catch? You ready? Or she's ready? All right. Great question. Okay. So you, that's where we kind of talk about not interpreting, but rather describing it. Um, and we avoid asking them any questions because again, their experience most likely, if you just kind of pay attention to what's going on around you, like if you see somebody else, um, oh my goodness, hi, how are you? It's so nice to see you, what have, what's been going on? That's, how many questions did I ask? <laughs> Too many, right? Three, somebody said three. Um, yeah, you get candy. Um, so three, I, 
You look scared. Don't be scared. Um, the, uh, but that is, that's actually very typical. Like once you start to kind of pay attention and you're more aware of like how, how much we like kind of come at and even really at these kids like with questions, like we have to take a step back. I mean, I would stop talking too if like these, everybody's like in your face, right? So we want to really kind of back up and give them time to sort of just warm up to us and warm up to being in the setting, warming up to being in another room with you. And so giving them that time and using that CDI can really help them sort of settle in. And it also doesn't set that expectation that I'm going to be asking you questions and you're not going to respond to me. I want the expectation I'm going to ask you questions and the goal is that you respond. So let me show you what this looks like. Cross your fingers, the videos work. Nope. All right, let me see if I can. Okay. Sarah, I love your drawing right there. That's so pretty. Can you hear it okay? I like all your hearts on the picture. Oh, cool, nice X's and O's. I'm going to draw some O's and hearts too. You can see she gets engaged in the play. Ooh, you can also be star. playing at the same. That's the I, right? And pride and imitation. Nice draw. Another star. I'm going to draw a star too. I see you like to draw hearts too, those are pretty. I'm going to change colors. I'm going to change new colors too, good idea. Oh, you made a nice pretty purple circle, mine's going to be red. Pretty snowflake. I like your drawings. Sarah, I love how you're putting that red block on top of that other red block. I see you looking at that foot. Thank you for sharing with me, Sarah. That's really nice you're playing together with me. You said you're welcome. Thank you so much for answering me. I like how you're making that tower nice and tall, Sarah. You're welcome. Thank you so much for answering that. I'm going to make this tower as tall as yours if I can. You're putting those two white so it blocks there. It feel like you're talking a it's lot. looking very nice. And you are. But you got to keep the, like, you, you want to keep the pacing up. You're putting that okay. blue tower on top of that red tower. Yeah, but it's also <laughs> like That's pretty a standard CDI. So even there. if the kid isn't SM, like this is sort of the rate at which you want your CDI to happen. That looks really nice, within Sarah. regular PCIT. Oh, that's so silly. Are, within regular PCIT, you're trying to get um, your parents or your clinicians to a mastery of like 10 label praises, 10 behavior descriptions, and 10 reflections within five minutes. So that's, it's a lot, actually. Um, and that's just like within, that's with kids who have ODD. That's not with SM kids. So, and oftentimes there's no, nothing is really being talked about in when you first get started. Um, and, but we want to try to keep up the positive skill so that they know like, yeah, there's an opportunity. I mean, you don't have to, if you start to know, and some kids will, you'll hear from their parent that they're just like, I don't like it when you use these skills. It's not comfortable because the parents aren't, um, necessarily really good at doing them yet, so they feel really awkward and robotic. Um, and we say, well, just give it a little bit more time. If you practice a little more, it will start to become kind of part of your everyday sort of way of speaking with them, as well as if you notice like a particular skill kind of irks them, then we tend to have the parents sort of back off on, on that skill, but maybe increase the other ones. Was our break supposed to be at 3 or 3.15? Okay, all right. 
Um, so any questions about, that was a great question. Um, any questions, you don't want any more candy? You probably don't even want more candy. What, what was your question? I was just gonna ask if you offered coaching for parents. Yes, so we, um, we do coach the parents, and again, it kind of um, varies depending upon um, whether we're getting kids ready for camp or we're like in individual treatment. Um, but we always coach the parents first, so they're in the room with the child. Um, so you could imagine that this is the, the parent and that's the child and they're, they're coached with them for probably, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes in the beginning so that they have time to warm up. Um, and we're coaching them in using those skills so that they get good at them. Um, and then in the course of the camp, we also do live coaching um, with them out in like around the camp environment. Um, any other questions related to that? This is the place you are trying to get them in the camp, or this is like normal? This is what we would do for everybody. Um, yeah, this is like CDI. This um, so when, uh, so initially what we would do is bring in the parent and the child into the room. They are playing, the parent has a bug in the ear. We basically say you can play with whatever you want. We're not in the room for the first Really, sorry, you asked how, I'm sorry, I got bad at not repeating my questions. So how long is this and is this um, standard for camp and this phase? So um, we don't have sort of like a set number of sessions in particular for the CDI. What we are looking for is for the child to get comfortable speaking to their parent on a pretty regular basis, right? So we do CDI, especially when they first come into the center. Um, we will have them do CDI until they look comfortable. So sometimes we schedule like a two hour session the first time because we want to be able to, once they start talking to their parent, then we end up fading in their therapist or their counselor um, to establish that speaking relationship. And I'll show you a video of what the fading looks like in after the break. Um, and so once, I'm really waiting to see sort of what happens with the kid. I want them to look comfortable. I want them to sound comfortable. They're verbalizing with their parent. It's looking like it's going well. Then that's when we start to fade a new person in um, and then try to get the parent out. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so good question. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Okay. Yes. And then the second, are there toys that you find lead to more vocalization? Um, so good questions. Let me repeat the questions. I forgot again. Um, so is it like true CDI where you let the child choose what activity and are there good activities to, to pick? Um, yes and yes. So uh, yes, we do let the kids choose the activities. Most of the time we have done our assessment. We've had a time with the parents. So we try to get at... What do the kids like to do? Do they like to build with Legos or um, play with Frozen related toys? Um, and so we try to bring at least three to four toys into the room that are related to something that we think they'll like. Um, but that are good for CDI. So what that means is that it's not something that has necessarily has rules. So it's not a you know, we, we do eventually bring games in because those can be really helpful, um, but not right at the beginning because we just want them to be good CDI toys. So things that are good for play. So building, Legos, um, drawing, markers, stickers, things that they can kind of make together. Um, those are really good things, things that are not going to introduce questions, criticisms, or commands into, the, into that. Um, so, and then eventually we do have... Um, a whole host of games that are really good. Um, Spot It is awesome. Headbands, Heads Up that's on your phone, awesome. Um, so there's all different kinds of games. And really, you can make any game uh, or any activity a speaking activity. Um, whose turn is it? Um, I forgot whose turn it was. Um, I really act like I don't have, I mean, you've noticed I don't have a good memory, but I act like I really have a bad memory. Like, I just don't remember whose turn it is, even if there's two players. Um, so tell me who's next, like so that you're creating sort of opportunities. Go fish is a great one because um, they have to tell the person go fish. So that's actually like a challenging one because there's initiation uno. So again, you can, I'm happy to tell you more of those games because there's, there's a lot. And then we've created a lot of stuff on our own just 
in terms of scavenger hunts and other things that like the kids can can do to have to ask questions and respond to questions. So, so we're not going to have time right this second to do the role plays, but um, before we go, are you guys willing to stay for like one extra minute to do a little task? Okay. So um, what we're going to do, we're going to, who wants to start? Which side? Awesome. Thanks for volunteering. Um, all right. So we'll start with you down there. What I'm going to have you do is turn, you can pick any of these. You don't have to go in order if you don't want to. I want you to give me an example of a labeled praise. Are you ready? So that might be, oh, I love how you just volunteered to answer my question. So you're up. Anything. Great label praise. So I'll go to you next, sir. It's so cool that you can draw a star and do so many different stuff. Yeah, great label praise. Good job this year. I'm proud of you. Mm -hmm. Nice label praise. That's great, you volunteered. Yes, no, that's a great label praise. I like the way you said thank you. Great label praise. Perfect label praise. <gasps> you can say the same exact thing. It's okay. Wow. Like you guys are in sync. <laughs> Great label praise. Good thinking on the spot. All right. Thank you for sharing with me. Great label praise. Good job using your visual voice. Oh, that's a nice one for SM. Yep. Uh, thank you for telling me what works. <laughs> Great label praise. Good job putting the suit on. Perfect praise. Yeah, nice praise. Um, thank you so much for doing so much in the video. You did that. Mm -hmm. Great praise. Um, I love the way you're saying your voice. Great praise. Thanks for asking us if we can stay hidden. Oh, perfect one. There we go. <laughs> um, that's great that you took the initiative. Yeah, perfect labeling that praise. Yep. Uh, nice smiley. Thank you. Yeah. Great praise. So I love you a lot. Thank you so much. How can you label the thank you so much? Thank you so much for? There you go. So that's labeling the praise. Does that make sense? So even though I love you a lot and thank you so much are totally awesome and we love hearing those things, it doesn't tell the kids specifically what you liked about what they were doing. Nope. But great effort. All right, here we go. I like when you answer my question. Ooh. Nice label praise. Nice work in choosing this toy. Great praise. Uh, great job remembering to use your voice. Mm, nice label praise. I like that you used your, you selected the red color. Great praise. I love this echo sound. Echo sound. <laughs> great, <laughs> great label praise. Thank you for telling me so what you want. Perfect praise for those kids with SM. Yep. Yeah, great label praise. All right, really nice label praises, guys. That's like your first practice. Um, did that feel okay to everybody? Okay, because we're going to do a couple more exercises like that when you get back. Um, and then we'll go into uh, talking about the VDI skills. Um, so I have no idea how long your break is. Is it 15 minutes? Okay, so we'll meet back at 3.30ish and get started. All right, thanks. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start um, just so that we can keep going through things. Um, hopefully everybody had a good break. Um, so what I wanted to do was a little bit more practice with um, some of the skills so that you guys get good at, um, at using them. Uh, so what we're going to do is kind of the same kind of thing going around, um, but I want you to practice doing a reflection. So um, again, what that's going to look like is if I say I want blue, um, then the reflection would be, oh, you want the color blue. You want blue. Okay? Um, and I have thrown some tricky ones in there. So um, either you can pick your own or we can go across. It doesn't matter to me. So I'm going to start with you over here and, um, and then we'll. We have a lunch break. We'll pass yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should I turn it on? Okay, so um, I want blue. 
You want blue. Great reflection. Here, I got it. Um, can I have that? You want this? Try one more time. You want the microphone? <laughs> so taper it down. You want the microphone. You want the microphone. Can you tell a difference between what you said the first time and the second? You want the microphone? Okay. You want the microphone. Can you tell the difference? Yeah. One's a question, one is a statement. We want the statements. Because okay. if we ask those questions back, what happens? Right. We've now just basically asked them a question and now they have to respond. We don't want to do that in CDI. Okay. I gave you a hard one, so I owe you candy in a minute. We are doing reflections. Okay, All right, so I need to go to the bathroom. You need to go to the bathroom. Yeah, great reflection. I have no idea what I'm on. Where's the coin? Oh, that's difficult. You want to know. Oh, you want to know where the coin is? OK, try one more time with, as a statement. You want to know where the coin is? Hey, there you go. Does every, so, oh, oh no. Did I break it? Oh my gosh. It's so expensive. Don't say that. Oh, no problem. It's, yeah. it's not mine. Does it sound OK? OK, I'm going to put it in my pocket. It wasn't in my pocket before. OK. Yeah. Now I'm extra. Thank you. OK. Um, so. You want to know where the coin is. Yes. So if you almost imagine yourself like on a downward, this is why I was doing this to you, even though you were like, I have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> if you imagine yourself sort of going downhill, um, it will also help you kind of keep your statements dropping at the end, like drop your tone at the end, and it will help make it a statement. OK? Um, yes. Yes. Good reflection. <laughs> no. You're telling me no. OK. So tricky, question, tricky one number two or three. Um, do you think that we want to reflect some kid who's just like, no? No, we don't. So because if we actually if we reflect that, it's going to reinforce the sort of nasty tone behavior. If they say, no, I don't really want to do that. Oh, so, no, you don't want to do that. That's fine. But if they're giving you attitude or tone, then we don't want to reflect. Does that make sense to everybody? So I owe you candy because you got another <laughs> tricky one. OK. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great reflection. My name is Sally. My name is Darcy. So how does she, I love, nice to meet you, Darcy. Um, so if she says, how do you reflect what she said? Your name is Sally. Yes, good reflection. <laughs> and then you can say, my name is Darcy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right. Um, I don't want to. You don't want to. Tricky number four. I don't know what I'm on. Do we ignore it? We ignore it. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Good answering. So because if they're giving you tone, so even though this isn't PCIT for oppositional behavior, some, sometimes these kids are going to have SAS, right? And so you don't want to um, reinforce the SAS. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, potato head. You're reflecting. Am How do you? Ignoring it? Nope. Potato head. It's again. How do you reflect if the kid says, potato head? So you want to play the game Mr. Potato Head? Oh, so close. Make it a statement. You want to play Mr. Potato Head? Yeah, there you go. Sorry, see, I get excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm probably blowing up the microphone system. Um, I want the red Lego. So you want the red Lego? Yeah, great reflection. I'm scared. You're scared. Yeah, good reflection. <laughs> You're silly. That's silly? No. You're saying I'm silly. That's negative though, right? Depends, right? So this is another tricky one. So if they're like, you're being so silly. Sorry, can we give them a mic? It's very I am horrible. I'm sorry. I'm failing at microphones like all over the place. OK. So if I say, oh, you're so silly, rather than you're being silly, would you reflect one and not the other? Yes. Yes. Like the positive yes, one. exactly. You are silly. So she is saying, I'm saying to you that you are silly. So you would say, 
Um, you're telling me I'm silly. Okay. You're telling me I'm silly. What about a reflection like, I'm silly. So the kid says, you're silly, and you say, I'm silly. Yeah, so I, I think it would count. It yes. Okay. Yeah. That feels more just yes. natural, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can I have another one? You want another one? Yep, good reflection. Uh, goldfish. Goldfish. Good reflection. <laughs> I'm going to let you pass it. I'm going to stop touching it. Um, yeah. You're mean. I'm not going to repeat it. Yay. <laughs> good job. Yeah. All right, so you're up next. Um, we're just reflecting. Okay, um, I want water. You want water. Yeah, great reflection. Um, can I play with that? Can I play with that? Okay, so I gave you a, I gave you a tricky one. Um, so I'm gonna need to give you candy in a minute. But um, <laughs> so if I say, can I play with that? You want to reflect it without giving me a question back. You want to know if you can play with that. That's what you want to say. So that's what you would say. What is the reflection? So the reflection would be, so I think of questions as almost like a three-part um, process, OK? So if they say, can I do this? Um, can I play with that? Can I go to the bathroom? You want to know if you can go to the bathroom. You can answer them. Answers are OK. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can go to the bathroom. Thank you for asking me. OK, so you've got your reflection. You've got an answer. Because if you just go, oh, you want to know if you can go to the bathroom? Yeah. And you don't do anything in, in addition, they're just like, what is going on? Um, they so, will be like, a, yes, you can go to the bathroom? Yes, yes. that's fine. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So what we want you to just get good at is, being, is reflecting them without re repeating straight back the question. So if, I, if they say, can I play with that? And you go, can you play with that? Then they're going to feel like they have to respond, and it's also. Then I have a question. Like when sure. you say, I want water, you can say, yes, you can have, you can have water. Or you, mm -hmm. you say, you want water? No, it's I, not like a I question. I would say, you, yes. you're asking if you can have water. Yes, you can have water. Yes, you can Thanks have for water. asking. Oh, thank you. That's why I say it's like three parts. Three parts. Yes, OK. <laughs> you want to know if, if she can hold the mic. Yes, she can hold the mic. Thank you for asking. Then it's like in three parts. Yes. Uh, yes. You are asking if you um, um, if you can have water or if you water, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. yes, you can have. Mm -hmm. And then thank you for asking. Yeah. You got all three parts. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Because I, I think those are kind of the trickiest ones. I'm gonna like a is, for me, it's a reflection on the same time. It's like a clarifying yes. The question. Yes. Um, answering and responding. Or like a brace in yep. the chat or something like that. Bye. Exactly. Am I doing something wrong again? I think these men are going to kill me. Um, all right. Who do I owe candy to while I ask you ask your question? Um, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm, I'm bringing you candy. Don't worry. <laughs> you get the mic. You get candy. You get candy. <laughs> OK. If they ask a question, but it's mumbled or under their breath in a way that you know they could probably go a step further, would you reflect part of it? Would you reflect but not answer? How would you, how do you take a stand on that? Um, did you need to do something first? <laughs> I'm totally failing at the mic situation today. So I would, um, I'd probably handle it a couple different ways. So I think that um, primarily what I'm going to do, if, I, if they have already been able to fully speak with me, then I would say, um, you know, uh, thanks for trying to tell me something. I didn't hear you. So I'm not going to say, um, like if I'm in CDI or something, then I would say, oh, I didn't hear that. You know, I love that you're trying to tell me something. I couldn't hear what you said, right? So I'm not, I'm not giving her a question, and I'm not giving her a command to answer me. If I'm in the next phase, which we'll get to in just a minute, then I may prompt her and say, I, I didn't hear you. Tell me again. You know, use a louder voice to tell me what you want. 
Um, so it varies depending on where I am with them in the treatment. Does that answer your question? Okay. Did I owe anyone else candy? Okay. All right, great job doing the reflections. Awesome work. Okay, so behavior descriptions. Uh, um, all right. This one is a little trickier to do by myself. Um, all right. So, oh, you're going to hate me because I'm going to make you. Can I give the, her the mic and then we'll pass it? <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Okay. I think this is not a good idea. <laughs> okay. He's telling me what he thinks. He is telling me what he thinks. Okay. Um, so I just want you guys to do a behavior description of what I'm doing, and it's okay if you repeat it because I'm not going to be changing up my behavior so much. So, um, so just and you can use those as stems if you want. Um, so um, just do the best you can. You're tossing the ball. Great behavior description. Oh, you're rolling it on, shaking it on the table. Yeah, good behavior description. You're shaking it. Yeah, good behavior description. You're giving me the box. Yeah, good behavior description. You're showing me the box. Yeah, hey, that's awesome. Great behavior description. Good behavior description. I'm going to give you a tough one for some reason. You're not doing anything with the box. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great answer. Um, that's correct. Yes, good behavior description. I was doing this also, so what am I doing? You're shaking your head. Yes, great behavior description. Does anybody know why that's a perfect behavior description? Um, she didn't say no? Yes, yes, great. All right. You have to hold it. I'm not allowed to hold it. Um, You're pointing at me. Good. Great description. You're nodding. Great description. You're holding up a number. Yep. Good description. You're mouthing something to me. Yes. Very good description. Perfect. Um, You're looking at the screen. Ooh, good. <laughs> Go you. Great behavior description. You look as if you have a question. What am I doing with my body? Holding back up your shoulders. Yeah. You're holding up your shoulders. You're shrugging your shoulders. Shrugging your shoulders. This is common. Because we would assume that they don't know, right? Uh... Pointing at the box. Good description. You're handing it to me. Uh, you yeah, want to say fine. you want something? No, because no. that's a question. Am that's I a qu reading? Yay! I didn't even have to. You just took yourself through that. I can leave I now. You. Um, yeah. You. Um, here's that's for you. Um, You're shaking the box. Yeah, great. And last one. Um, You are trying, you put the box over the phone. Yeah, great behavior description. All right. Really nice job, everybody, with your behavior descriptions. I know those are, that's not easy with me with a box of candy. <laughs> He's making faces at me. Okay. Um, so what I want to um, have you guys do for, again, we don't have that much time, so I'm gonna give you just a couple of minutes. Um, we're gonna do some role plays, so I don't know what we do with the microphone at this point. Um, so I'll let you guys tell me what to do with those. Um, so if you can, with the person next to you, one of you be a child, one of you be a parent, therapist, teacher, whoever you are, um, and I want you to try to get in at least one behavior description, one reflection, um, and one um, label praise about what they're doing. You all mostly have pens, pencils, something, and I'm sorry, I meant to grab some of my kids' toys and bring them and I forgot. Um, or I can hand out other candy. 
Okay? A behavior description, a reflection, and a label praise. The three things that we just practiced um, that you all were great and successful at doing, I want you to try to practice with one another um, and then switch. So once you've done, again, I'm gonna, I can time it and then we'll switch, okay? <laughs> This note right. You said in about five minutes there should be a behavior label and a re and five ten, ten, ten and ten and ten. And ten. Okay. I was like, why would it be five? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Oh good. Everybody has a partner. Okay. Someone asked if it was 10, 10, and 10, or 10 and 5 in, 5 in 5 minutes. So it's 10 behavior descriptions, 10 reflections, and 10 labeled praises in 5 minutes. You do not need to do that right now. That's not, I don't expect that of you. I just want you to practice using those skills in a few minutes with, with your partner. <laughs> Good skills. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like this? No, no, no. You give it to them. Oh, yeah. Some water. Good behavior description. Yes, Mom, I'm thirsty. Yeah, you're thirsty. Good reflection. Good job at putting the cap off on the water. Thanks, Mom. Great label praise. Good job. You got all three. Okay, so if you feel like you got all three, then switch to the next person so that everybody gets a chance. We're doing this very fast, unfortunately. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just you got like the worst presentation right now. <laughs> does laughter, when you laugh at her, does that count as a reflection? Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. That's a really good question. Um, so, especially for kids who are very limited in making any sound, right? So if, like, if they're not talking to you yet and they actually make a laugh sound, then we want to reflect that we want to praise them for oh I heard you laugh thanks for letting you know I loved hearing you you laughing um, so it might not be that I start like ha 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 back but I would say oh I heard you laughing so does that make sense okay great question I'm gonna go over here <laughs> Did everybody get a turn? Yep. Oh, wow, you guys are fast. Okay. <laughs> You're getting recorded now. Good describing. Good describing. Yay! Good label praises. Perfect. All right. Any questions? You guys good? Both of you get a chance to get all three in? Awesome. Do you want to do it or do you want to? Sure. Do you want to be the child or the adult? I could be a child. You're covering your ears. Could be her description. asking me what the other one was. Yay, good <laughs> reflection. That was good, very nice skills. Any questions you guys have over here? No. Anybody want to practice? No. <laughs> we got all of the components. Okay, all right, great. Do you guys have any questions? You're good? Our question for you is like the reflection will be um, like a commenting on also or only when the, when the child is asking you or when they 
like, is it a praising, praising is mm -hmm. when you say, well, you know, you are doing a beautiful star. Sure. You're using, you know, the, the color blue in the house looks uh -huh. beautiful. Now, let's say that the child continues being quiet and is not asking you anything yeah. about it. How you... You may not have any reflections. Oh, okay. So that's, that's, a, that's a really good point, yeah. So if, if you're actually coding like a parent in these skills and the child says nothing, then you're not going to have any reflections. But if you... Um, but another person asked um, over there that if they're laughing, do you reflect the laughter? Like, how do you do that? So yeah, I might start laughing. I might say, oh, I heard you laughing. Thanks so much for, for making that sound with me and laughing. It's so nice to hear you laughing, OK? okay? Um, especially if they're making very limited sound or they're not talking at all, then we're going to reflect that. Does that answer yeah, your yeah, question? Yes, yes. OK. Thank you so much. OK, great. All right. Um, very nice reflection. Okay, so we're going to move on to um, to VDI now. Any questions that came up? Um, I'm going to make one comment just because it kind of came up in a couple different areas. But if they are making sound and they have not really been doing anything, um, one, it's okay if there are no reflections like kind of coded in that CDI time if they're not saying anything. Okay. What we look for is that if I'm actually coding to mastery, um, let's say of my clinicians who have to meet mastery of these skills, then I'm going to make sure that they can reflect at least 80% of what is said. So if they only say three things or five things, then I know that they were at least able to reflect four out of the five things. If they make a sound <laughs> like that, then, oh, <laughs> That's great. I love that I heard you laughing. Um, so you can praise them. You can acknowledge that you heard the sound. Does that make sense? OK. Um, you, and then I'm sorry, and then I'll come to you. Sorry. Um, the mic. Oh. He, you are going to be exhausted by the time we're done. OK. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Anybody have an idea of? They tell you if you're wrong. They may tell you if you're wrong. So it's not a bad thing. Right. They may say, no, that's not what I wanted. And then, oh, oh thanks for, yeah, exactly, great reflection. So that, then it gives you a chance. One, it gives them an opportunity to speak up if it's not right um, and correct you. Or even if you're not quite sure, you can always just say, I didn't quite hear you. I didn't hear what you said. So you're not actually, you're just, that's basically like talk. It's just neutral, right? You didn't, you're not asking for them to do anything. You're not giving a command. So great question. And then he's not going to let me touch that. Yeah. Sorry, you have to talk into the mic. I have a question regarding um, negative reinforcement. I, okay. don't, I don't know if you want to ask now or at the end. Of no, the, go ahead. And then okay. I'll tell you if we can. This is about the, the, this is about the case that I'm supervising. Okay. It is a, a girl that has selective mutism. And she's in school. And now all the kids know that she doesn't talk. Yep. So somebody new comes and they, um, they tell the rest that, Oh, no, 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 she doesn't talk, but what she means is, like, yep. she means this and that and yes. that and every, so now it's not the teacher, because you can teach the, teach the teacher, Yes. but now they are the kids saying that. Yes. So how do you change that? Yes, great, um, great question. So I'll just, we'll just set it down, because okay. otherwise I'm going to have oh, okay. three mics on me. Um, that's a really good question, So, um, which we get all the time. So oftentimes within the classroom setting, we do try to have either the teacher educate the other children um, at a time possibly when the child who has SM is not in the room to just say, you know, I know you guys are, and sometimes as a therapist we do this too, um, especially if we go in and we're trying to help them uh, be able to speak more directly to other people. Um, we will encourage them to, you know, it's so nice of you that you're trying to help them. She's actually trying to um, work on using her brave voice right now. So even if she tells you and you know the answer, I'm going to tell you to wait and let's let's give Sally a turn to, to respond, okay? Um, because what's happened is now she's become the girl who doesn't talk in the class. Everybody talks for her. So really she has no need to talk. 
So we have to kind of take a lot of that accommodation away. Um, and the only way we can really do that is through kind of the teacher knowing, oh, oh, hold on, hold on one second, Jackie, let Sally answer for herself, okay? Which you might do for any kid anyways, right, who's a little slower to warm up to the class. And so it's really, um, I talk a lot about air traffic controlling with families and teachers that it's, it's a little bit of like, okay, you have to wait, now you, now you respond. Um, any questions about that? Yeah, great question. Okay. All right, so let's go into VDI. So VDI is the verbal directed interaction. And there are three types of questions that we use in VDI. So um, forced choice questions, open-ended open questions, and then we really try to stay away from yes, no questions. Um, why do you think we stay away from yes, no questions? Yes. Yep, that's, that's part of it. Yep. Yes, yes. Nonverbal communication. They are much more likely to give you a head nod if you ask them a yes, no question than if you ask these other two types of questions. So if you think back to that assessment task that we, that we do, the SMICs, um, we actually see that they are more likely to give a verbal response if you ask them open-ended questions and forced choice questions. Forced choice being your first go-to because it's kind of the, in my mind, it's the easiest kind of question followed by an open-ended question. And then if you really have to, you can break it down into a yes, no question. Um, and I'll talk about that one in, in just a minute. Question two. What yes. Well, yes, and that's, that's tricky. You're right. They could point, but that's when you would use your behavior descriptions. Oh, I see you pointing. Still don't know what, what, which one you want until you use your words, right? So, um, but yeah, great question. So, forced choices really give you multiple chances, right? So it's like your multiple choice questions on your tests. Um, so ultimately, you can make anything into a forced choice question. Um, what it does is it provides the, the an answer within the prompt of the question. So what's nice about that is, um, again, it's easier. They don't have to think of something all by themselves. Sometimes for these kids, it's harder to just even think of the word that they want to say. And so sometimes giving them that, that choice is really helpful for them to respond, OK? Um, the next type is open-ended question. Your who, what, where, when, why, like your five W questions are really good. Um, anything, again, you know, tell me, uh, or where did you go for, for a break? Um, you know, what do you want to eat? What do you want for your drink? Um, any of those kinds of things are going to be open-ended questions. These are a little bit harder, right, because they have to generate it all on their own. Um, but you can always work to have them expand from one word answers to multiple kind of multiple words or a full sentence. So yes, no questions. We talked about why we want to avoid these, right? Um, one is because it's pretty simple in terms of the answer they can give, yes, no. Um, sometimes you have to start with this, OK? Um, again, we try very hard not to ask these questions. Everybody will ask a yes, no question at times, but we really try to minimize these as much as possible. So if you hear yourself asking a yes, no question, try to f switch it quickly into a forced choice. Like, have you, have you had dessert um, or have you not had a chance to have it yet, right? So just tack the word or onto the end of your yes, no and turn it into something else, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. What is, what is your name? name? Yes. Milan. Milan? Yes. Okay. So Milan, I'm, I'm going to have you moving around again. Please and thank you. Yeah. Um, so, because we're going to do another practice. <laughs> I figure I should, I should know your name if I'm making you run around the room. Um, okay. So uh, quickly, we're going to turn each of these yes-no questions into a forced choice or open-ended question. Okay? Um, so I'll start up here. Do you want more? Go ahead, please. Do you want more? Do you want more uh, bread or dessert? Yeah, great turning it into a different question. Do you want to play? Do you want to play or take a, 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 or take a rest? Yeah, great question. Do you want to color? You want to color or you want to um, draw? Great question. Uh, do you, did you finish your dinner? Did you finish your dinner or would you like more? 
Great question. Are you hungry or are you full? Great question. Do you want me to call her or do you want to go? Yes. Great, changing that into a forced choice. You're on, do you want a cookie? Do you want a cookie or would you rather cake? Both, yeah. Um, did you make that? Yeah. Um, did you make that or did someone help you? Yeah, great question. Was it fun? Or was it? Oh, sorry, that's hers. Okay. Was it fun? <laughs> was it fun or was it boring? Oh, yeah. Great question. You're on, can you help me? Can you, can you help me or do you want to help, uh, help a friend over here? Yeah, great. I'm allowed to pass. All right. uh, do you need to go to the bathroom? Do you need to go to the bathroom or are you okay? Good question. Can you find it or do you need my help? Yeah, perfect question. Uh, I will do it, okay? I will do it, okay? Or do you want to do it? <laughs> yeah, you got a tricky one again. You can open it, right? Or you need help? Yep. Oh, so some of those, okay, um, it's almost like, oh, you want to do that, okay? Right? Yeah? Those are all, those all end up turning into yes, no's. If you think about it, if you say, okay, you're really actually getting, you're pulling for a yes, no response from them. So instead, that's why you want to flip it into something else. Do you want my help or do you want to do it by yourself? Yeah, great change. Should I take it or do you want to keep it? Yeah, great question. You can pick one, ask anything you want. What do you need my help with? Yeah, great open-ended. Great way to, I'll leave that here. Great way to um, finish that up. Okay, so does that make sense? Because we ask a lot more yes, no questions than you probably will ever realize. Um, so even with like your partner, your dog, your friends, start recognizing like the things that you're, how you're speaking, because it will definitely make a difference. So some of the things that are really important in within the VDI is kind of creating certain, um, we use certain skills and um, also about wait time. So one is we're gonna avoid yes, no questions. You always wanna give them five to 10 seconds to respond after you ask a question. Most of the time when we ask questions, we, we may ask three in a row without giving anybody even a chance to respond, okay? So, um, okay, so I think, I don't know, you want a dinner, what, what do you want for dinner tonight? Do you think that we should have this or do you think we should have steak or chicken? I'm not really sure, what do you think you want? Whoa, take a breath, right? So if you actually help slow people down, and most of the time this is gonna be parents and even teachers to slow them down and give that child an opportunity to respond as well as to learn it does matter what they say, right? So for example, in class, um, and you ask a question, we want that teacher really to wait. And some kids really need a full 10 seconds. And you can work on kind of increasing their, their rate of response. Um, by making them answer a little faster, but you really wanna give them that, that time. Does that make sense? Okay, and that is hard to do. I would, so for some families where you're really struggling and they, they're just like jumping in, I will count um, out loud. Um, so they ask, okay, so go ahead and ask your first choice question. Do you want red or blue? One, two, three, four, five. And then you can ask the question again. Okay, so we will always ask the same question two to three times. This gives them an opportunity to think about the question. They may not be quite ready to answer the first time. Um, and then we'll wait again for five to 10 seconds. Typically after that second or third time, we will either change the format of the question, we will ask the diff a different question altogether, um, or we will go into um, kind of a, a verbal command. So I'll explain that in a minute. So, um, if they are struggling, we will often take them outside or pull them off to the side to practice, just like you might if somebody was having trouble with a different exposure, you might pull them off and be like, okay, let's you know, do our, our fear plan or tell me what a coping thought could be. This is you're gonna pull them off and say, okay, so I know you told me before that you liked vanilla ice cream. So when they ask you, do you want vanilla or chocolate, what are you gonna say? Vanilla. Okay, great, thanks for telling me that you want vanilla. 
Okay, so you're just reminding them of what their response was and praising them and, and helping them get through it. Oh, sorry. Um, if they are kind of going into what we sort of call shutdown mode, like where you're asking questions and they're not responding and they're not responding to things that you feel like, no, nah, they're, they're typically able to do this, then we will try to go back to a question that they already answered, right? That they already told me that they like blue. So I am losing my memory again. What is your favorite color? Is it blue or green? Um, put that stem back in there. Help them remember that they already were able to do that um, because it should help them kind of get out of that mode and back into being able to respond. Um, and that if you really have to, then we will say, you know, it seems like you're having trouble answering this question. Right now, I'm gonna, I want you to think about your answer. I'm gonna come back to you. Because what typically happens is that school, in particular, moves very fast. Teachers do not have time to wait. So what ends up happening, though, is that they just kind of get skipped over and forgotten. And so then it makes them feel like, eh, it doesn't really matter if I just they're not going to call on me anyways. I don't have to respond. I'll just wait it out. We want them to learn, nope, we're coming back to them. We are going to ask them. Um, and so we want that to start to be their expectation as well. Okay? And you're always using your CDI skills mixed in with your VDI. So if, if you know PDI, then you're doing CDI and PDI together. Same thing with CDI and VDI. Okay? So Sarah, do you want to use the markers or the crayons next? Can you see? The markers. You can just tell me the markers in the next four words, and then we give you a big check for that. Brad, do you want the cookie or candy? Cookie or candy? Do you want the cookie? Yes or no? I see you nodding. Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I love this example because this is much more typical of what you're going to get. Okay, so she went through her forced choice question. There's just no movement, silence, right? Um, and so what she ended up doing, um, she asked it a second time. She waited her five seconds, asked a second time. She still got no response. So um, we sort of turned we sort of turned a yes no question into a yes no forced choice style question um, that I still try to stay away from. But if like you really have to kind of move down to the yes no question just to get something, then make it like that. Okay, I don't know why it feels different, but it actually is. So if you say yes or no, you're basically giving them a forced choice question rather than just saying do you want that. Does does that make sense? Um, and we get differential response from these kids when we do that, uh, when we ask the yes, no like that. Um, and so then she went into, mm -hmm, yep, I want that. So she did her behavioral description, asked the question again. So typically you're going to pair the behavior description with a question or another prompt. So typically it's either going to be repeat the question, did you want the cookie or something else? Um, or if you have done that a whole round again, then you can also bring in what we call a direct command for verbalization, which is, um, tell me with your words what you want. I see you nodding. Tell me what you want. Yeah. I'm sorry. Is that, you guys are... I don't have it. <laughs> you guys are utilizing the DRC in this aspect, correct? Yes, yes, which I will explain in a minute. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 you're right, because it's on the yeah. video. The DRC is daily report card. Um, basically, we use behavior charts. Um, uh, so let me, let me answer a question you're not asking. But um, we use very simple charts that are just boxes. Um, for, for most of the kids that, we come, that come into us, we laminate them so we can use both sides. And we pretty much just use whiteboard markers so that they can write on it, erase it, and keep going. Each time they're verbalizing, um, they get a check. At the end of the check, they get a gold coin. They turn the gold coins in for prizes in the treasure chest. So just to update you as to why that, why, what she's giving her there. Yeah. So what is your, sorry, what was your question? I forgot. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. But um, a secondary question is, the clips aren't available on the actual PowerPoint presentation. I don't think they're coming through. I can send you a whole playlist of these clips. Yes, that would be fantastic. Okay. I will... 
If you guys want to take a piece of paper and write your email addresses on the paper. Yeah, sure. Mine's on the, I think you all have, yeah, it's on the PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm sorry, I did embed them. I, they don't, they didn't save, I don't know why. Um, but good question. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is come No, no, please. What was your question? No, I can't remember. Okay, if you think of it, just yell it out. Okay, so let me get to some of the other VDI skills that, um, that we use that we kind of incorporate into our treatment. So um, I'm gonna talk through some coping strategies briefly, contingency management, which is basically the reward system that we use using fade-ins and shaping and the exposures. So as I mentioned before, we do use um, coping strategies. So we teach them different bravery lessons. Um, we teach them about hopefully that they can use these skills and access them prior to going into the exposure. Or if they're kind of getting dysregulated, then we, will, we may pull them out and say, okay, let's go do our pizza breaths. So pizza breaths, I'm gonna have you all do it with me. You basically take um, a piece of pizza in your hand Pretend to take a piece of pizza in your hand. Um, or whatever their favorite food is. If they are like, I hate pizza, I don't like it, then chicken fingers, mac and cheese, whatever they want to eat. Um, their favorite thing that's probably hot, breathe it in through your nose and cool it off. Okay, it's very simple. Kids know how to cool off their food. Um, it teaches them to breathe out through their mouth and in through their nose. Smell in the pizza and cool it off. Okay. There's lots of different fun ways to teach deep breathing um, to kids. So for the really young kids, um, so we give all of them like a fake slice of pizza to, to take home with them. And we also um, do this butterfly breathing where, um, and I don't have an example of it on here, but you take like a, a white like water cone and you put little petals in it, like fake petals, and then you cut a hole in the bottom and put a straw in. And they have to breathe just like very deeply in order for the, and then the little things float when, I, this sounds very silly right now as I'm explaining it, but they float in the air and the little kids are just like, oh, I got it to float. But it teaches them very much how to do slow, deep breathing, okay? Bubbles, bubbles, bubbles yep. Like blowing bubbles in their, in their milk, anything that's gonna teach them to really slow down their breathing, okay? Squeezing lemons, um, so I want you to all pretend like you have a lemon in your hand and I want you to squeeze all the juice out of it really hard, get all the juice out. Okay, good. Now relax your hands. Good, oh, one more lemon. Squeeze all the juice out. Yeah, good. Awesome, now we have enough juice to make lemonade. So we talked to them about making lemonade and that we need the juice out of the lemons and that ultimately when you're squeezing your hand and when you let go, you can feel the tension sort of release in your hand and your hand feels better when you're more relaxed, okay? Um, if you have squeeze balls, any of those things can be really nice. Um, and then we do teach them different coping thoughts. We provide them, the older kids, with coping cards where they can write down their coping thoughts on them. So we talk to them about doing detective thinking in a very simplistic way. Um, so for those of you who know cognitive restructuring, you're basically trying to help them identify what is that anxious thought that they're having um, and how can we help them think more logically about what is going to happen? So a lot of times these kids are afraid that, um, you know, they're all going to turn and stare at me when I first talk, um, or I don't like how my voice sounds. They're going to hear my voice. I don't want them to hear my voice. So we try to understand what is their anxious thought, and then we help them try to think more logically about it. So that may either mean come up with something more positive, right? Like, uh, you know, no, that's not happened before, I'll, you know, so it's unlikely to happen now. Um, or thinking about something more logically. So if it is likely that they will all look at you the first time you speak, okay, great. Do you think that'll happen the second time, the fourth time, the tenth time you start talking? Nah, eh, maybe. But what about the hundredth time you start say, saying something? No, kids, kids move on pretty fast, okay? Yes. And why are they excited? Because they're, you're talking. They want to be friends with you. They're excited you're sharing something. It's a good thing, but it will go away. 
It doesn't last forever. I've done it before. I can do it again. Um, any of the more general statements we try to give to some of the younger kids who can't really generate that on their own. Um, and again, typically six, seven, eight year old is where developmentally they can actually have the cognitive wherewithal to come up with their cognitions. Some kids are younger, but for the most part, we try to um, just kind of give them something that they can do or I can be brave. Um, we had one kid who loved LeBron James and so he was just like, yeah, I'm gonna be LeBron, yeah. I'm like, that's, he had to do that before he did any of his exposure tasks. Whatever works for them, right? Um, so get them kind of thinking something and so this is one example where he, um, he came up with his coping thought of it's not as scary as it seems. And so you can see the little key ring and they can take that key ring with them with the coping cards and they have it whenever they're going through their exposures. Um, we also use contingency management, which can be, again, in our terms, is really using rewards for their brave behavior. Um, that's how we talk about it, right? If you uh, didn't get a paycheck for going to work, you probably wouldn't go to work. Um, so we really, a lot of times, have to explain the difference to parents about a bribe versus a reward system, why we're not bribing your children to talk, like, because they say, oh, I've bribed my child to talk already. Um, and typically, it's like they're giving them the thing, if, and then they go do... The, the talking behavior and ultimately if you have a system set up in advance they know each time they use their words they get this but they have to use their words in order to get that reward. So we really try to explain to parents do not give the reward before they actually do the thing that you want them to do okay because then they won't do it. Um, we have used a variety of things depending upon um, who they are and what they like. So for some kids, they hate the checks, they will rip up my chart. I go to stickers, I go to little pieces of candy, um, points, um, getting to play a game, anything can really be a, a reward. So you may have to take a step back and talk with parents about, if you're finding that this basic system doesn't work, then you can always talk with the parents about what are they already getting, how do we need to modify that so that it's, it's worth their time, okay? Because they are working really hard. Um, so some of this I've already said. Obviously, a reward system is going to increase the frequency of a behavior, right? So what we've noticed is that if they come in and they're getting checks just for talking to their parent in the room without anybody present, I typically have them work their way through a full chart before I let anybody else go into the room. So before I start a fade-in process, I have them getting a whole one just for talking to their parent. Like, awesome, yeah, get them bought into the system and then have somebody fade in. Okay, so now, I, um, in order to keep earning your checks, you need to answer me in front of Dr. Fur. So it's not like you need to answer Dr. Fur to get this. This is the part of the shaping process that has to happen, right? Like, I can't expect that to a kid who's never talked to anybody new to go from talking to their parent to then just talking to me, not, you know, on their own. So it's just get them comfortable talking in front of you, and then we sort of fade in using our CDI skills. All right, um, so just like within PCIT, consistency, predictability, and follow through are very key. If you promise that child a reward for something that they did, you better give them that reward, okay? So you may have to talk to parents about being realistic about what reward they're promising for what behavior, right? If they, can't ha if they don't have access to it, then don't promise it. And for little kids, they need something more immediate, oftentimes more tangible. Right? These kids love these coins, like they're like holding them in their hand. We use like little fanny packs or purses or whatever they want. Um, but it's oftentimes important for them to hold on to like, oh, this, is, this shows that I did it. Um, and then really the goal is to fade it out over time. So parents are just like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to provide this kid with rewards for the rest of my life. Well, no. Like once you start seeing a behavior more consistently, then you can start to decrease the reward and you up the level of challenge for what they actually get the reward for. Does that make sense? You're all nodding your head, so I'm assuming, I'm gonna mind read and say yes. Okay, so let me show you. So this is gonna go through um, the fade in process. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just skip forward. Okay, so let me just give you a heads up. So typically before you start any fade in process, you're gonna be talking with the person who will be fading in um, and helping them to know kind of when they're supposed to be moving in, 
um, and kind of how fast. So typically when we start something, we are oftentimes in pairs. So we have one person coaching the parent and then we have our other, the, the primary counselor who's gonna be with that kid fading in so that we can coach the parent to prompt the kid again or ask the question again, that kind of thing. Um, so the, the man sitting here is Tommy. He's the therapist slash parent. And then the teacher is coming into the room Great. Oh, cool. So you're racing on the dry erase board. It's really cool that they have one of these here. What are you going to draw first, Sarah? I don't know. You don't know. Thanks for telling me you don't know. Cool. I guess we'll just have to find out. And now you have a blue marker and you're drawing a rectangle. Cool rectangle. Really nice drawing of a rectangle. So behavior description label praise. Oh, and you drew a little spike at the bottom of it. Behavior description. Sarah, what are you drawing? I have no idea. You have no idea. Good telling me. So open-ended question. And you cut it in half. Praise. And then again in half, kind of. Do you think we get one of these for our house, yes or no? Yes. Okay. Yes, good answering. Rayless cool. is waiting at the door. We literally oh, stand at the door marker. and wait for them to be. It looks like we have some other markers over here. Do you want a different color or do you want to stay with blue? I want purple. You want purple. Thanks for telling me you want purple. Good choice. You're going to be giving signals you're drawing, to move You're drawing closer. ears on your blue monster. I'm going to pause it. Um, when she came into the room, when the, ther when the teacher came into the room, um, ideally he would have praised her for answering his question in front of her. Thank you for telling me that in front of Ms. Lopez. Okay. So you're already starting to, that's why your praises need to be so specific, right? Thank you for telling me that in a voice that I could hear that they could hear over there, right? It's going to help them understand like now this person is here and they heard me, okay, right? They're not asking me to talk directly to them yet, but they're, they, they're hearing me, okay? So it's gradual exposure to speaking to somebody. That's a really cool petal that you're making for your giant flower. Very abstract. You're coloring it in purple. You're coloring the other side. Do you want to stick with purple or do you want a different color? I don't want a different color. You don't want a different yeah, color. Thanks for telling me you don't want a different color with Miss Lopez in the room. I heard that so loud. Thank you for saying that with me in the room. So we also do coach um, sometimes, depending upon the kid, we will coach the parent or the, the teacher to say, or the therapist to say, oh, I heard that. Thanks for saying it loud enough for me to hear. So we're not like, we, we just want them to know we're kind of making a statement and a praise so that they're already getting used to us being somewhat in the conversation. And some people fade faster and slower than others. Like you'll see other groups who it's like they, bring the person right in and they're at the table, they're just not like it's pretty abstract. What do you think it looks them like? direct questions yet. A monster. A monster. Thanks for telling me of Miss Lopez in the room. Thank you for saying it's so loud with me in the room. I heard that. Cool monster. Do you think it's the kind of monster that goes out at night or during the day? At night. At night? That was so loud. Thank you for saying that so loud. Sarah. Question. Praises from everybody. Sarah, what do you He's think? giving her checks. Yes or no? Um, yes. 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 How do you, you ask her to drop us? Can you come drop us? Awesome yes. asking Miss Lopez to come drop. This moves her a little fast because all of a sudden she has to ask a question. This is where I'm going to say, do not do what I have on my video. I'm sorry. We're making some more videos. Um, you want them to be answering something before you actually have them initiating. Okay, Responding is easier than um, initiation. OK? Um, let me oh, with us, two voice. checks for that really big full voice. Oh, thank you for asking really so nice loud job. in a bright voice. Oh, so now you're oh, putting so ears on the monster. I love it using the purple marker <laughs> for the eyes. Looks so pretty. Now you're using the black one. Wow, those are big black eyelashes. I love how you put in the black eyelashes. Oops, I 
your racing line. Mm -hmm. Wow, so, so Miss Lopez, I think, is going to draw with you. What color do you think she should use? What color is that? Red. Red. So can anybody tell me for a lollipop or candy, if they want it, um, what you noticed about what just happened there? Yes, so that is one thing. He transferred, he transferred it basically to her, right? And the second thing is, does anybody recognize what happened with the marker? He, he held them out, so she could have just chosen without asking. And she did, initially. She just picked it up, and then what did he do? Then he asked for the Yes, exactly. Okay? So they're very subtle, right? Even those things you want to be able to kind of have your therapist or you pick up on those little things that might happen where all of a sudden, like, they're doing stuff and there's, there's no speech, even though he had asked her a question. Okay, but yes, now that it's like transferring it over to her and you notice she started to pick up her CDI, right? He's talking less. She is talking more now because now we really want her to be involved in this conversation, but she's not going straight into, oh, so now what are you coloring, right? It's more like I'm going to use my CDI skills, let her get used to me talking to her, and then eventually she moves into her. Can you tell her what color marker you got for her? Oh, but look at her one more time. What color marker did you get for her? Good telling her red. Awesome job telling her red and handing her that marker. So you can also start to shape eye contact, looking up at them, again, depending on where you are in, in treatment, okay? If we have time, we will come back to that. And, okay. So that's like the fade-in process, okay? It just basically means that you're fading. Like if you were fading somebody who had a spider phobia and you were slowly fading a spider in, you're basically doing the same thing with people. You're the, like, we're the fearful stimuli. Okay, so you slowly move them closer to that thing. Um, we also use a lot of shaping, okay? Um, and this is really where you are able to, for some kids who need a slower sort of transition, right? So for her, he was able to say, okay, so she answered me, now, t now answer, now answer Miss Lopez. Some kids are really gonna need a slower shaping than that, so you're basically uh, getting the behavior that you want and you're slowly, doing like a, you're shaping yourself over to closer to that next person who you are hopefully getting them to transfer their, their verbalization to. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so, um, so ultimately, um, you may be asking that same question um, a number of times. So even though, and you're expecting the same answer, which is fine. Okay, um, you don't need to switch up your question in the middle um, because ultimately you want them to get like, yep, it's blue, 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 blue. Now tell her that it's blue, blue, right? So if they, an if they start doing it a number of times, it's going to be easier and more rote for them to just answer. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so obviously we do a lot of practice and exposure. That's really the crux of it, just like any other anxiety treatment and really kind of helping them to go into lots of different situations, asking for help. We do a lot of favorite survey questions, like what's your favorite color? What's your favorite story? What's your favorite movie? And we have them go around our center that has a lot of people in it and ask as many possible people as they can. Okay. Um, or what we may do is go and say, um, they have to, we ask the person, can you ask them this question? that they have already rehearsed with you. Okay, so you're doing a lot of role play ahead of time and then putting them into that situation. Um, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go through the slides and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna show you a video so I don't have to keep going back and forth. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. So ultimately what you're gonna create is a brave talking ladder. Fear hierarchy, fear ladder, you can call it whatever you would like. But basically, you're going to start with easier situations, right? So we think of like talking in the room with the parent by themselves with the, you know, the bug in the ear. Eventually, you fade the counselor in. We, fa we often fade in more than one person. So we try to get a couple people in the room at a time with this kid. And then we actually try to get the parent out of the room, right? So if they're having fun and they're playing games and hopefully they're having a good time, they're going to notice less that mom is leaving. We often, like I said, we do our surveys because um, it's a nice kind of structured way to do it. And then depending upon where their anxiety really manifests, oftentimes it's going to be in school. Then we will try to speak with the teacher and set up a school visit pretty quickly. Um, 
if the child is taking a while to kind of make these gains here, then we'll spend a little more time here establishing our relationship before we go to the school. What, we, what has happened before is that for some kids, they are just like refusing to talk with us. Um, and ultimately that's okay, right? Um, I, it doesn't matter if they talk to me, it matters that they answer their teacher questions and that they answer you know, their specials teachers. So then we will do much more intensive work within the school setting and getting them talking to their teacher and doing the fade in with the teacher rather than making sure they can talk to us. As long as they have like a person there that is kind of their champion, then that's really all you need is somebody you can transfer those skills to and have them be the person who's doing the work. You had a question, yes? Yes, uh, yes and yes. Um, great question, so you wanna know like if, do you tell the child if the mom's gonna fade out or not? It really does depend on the kid, depends on their age, depends on if separation is in the mix. For some kids, we have to like, we slowly fade mom out. For other kids, we're like, mom has to go to the bathroom, she'll be back in a little while, and they leave. Um, typically, the faster there is, better. Um, it doesn't draw it out so much, but some kids really need to know mom is gonna be by the door, and they're still able to do what they need to do. Does that make sense? So if like you're really seeing this very big separation, anxiety kind of moment when mom leaves the room, then I may sit with mom like right at the door, right outside of the door and have the kid really engaged in something fun and playing. And then eventually I can move mom back. And that's where I would say, okay, so you're gonna keep getting checks if you can do this while mom is sitting at the door. So then I'm explicit about it, right? I don't wanna trick them. Um, but so it really, it does depend on the kid. So we, we will move them up the, the hierarchy and have the teacher hopefully fade in. Sometimes we've had teachers come to our office if we feel like the school is so contaminated that it's just not gonna go well, then we'll get them speaking in our office first and then we can transfer it hopefully over to the school. Um, some teachers are able to go to kids' houses or meet at a playground or something where it's less new, you know, it's a more neutral setting. Um, sometimes we will even start the, the fade in work with the teacher um, on the playground or in the gym or somewhere that's not the classroom because the classroom is so contaminated, okay? Um, and then you slowly move them up to doing, to talking to more people, increasing their speaking circle. For some of the older kids, you can have them write down, who do they wanna start talking to first? Um, you know, uh, who do you not wanna talk to? Okay, we'll leave them for last um, so that you can have, have some of their, some of them be helping, okay? So ultimately, if you remember sort of our negative cycle of reinforcement, um, where the adult rescues, everybody feels better, but we've now negatively reinforced the anxiety, we're hoping to really re kind of switch it on its head and, and reverse this cycle into positive reinforcement for brave talking. So the child's prompted to talk, the child becomes overly anxious and they try to avoid, they're still probably gonna hide, but instead now what happens, instead of that adult rescuing, that adult is gonna give the child an opportunity to respond, they're gonna ask questions in the right way, and they're gonna shape that child's verbal behavior. So that then, Yay, a child answers question. We give lots of positive attention, label praises, woohoo. And then hopefully uh, we have now given positive reinforcement for their brave talking. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm gonna show you a video real quick because I think this will be a good, this kind of captures um, a good amount of it. Um, Sarah, you've been super brave practicing at home with me, introducing yourself, and going over your favorites questions. So now we're going to practice in real life introducing yourself and asking what, any kind of question that you would like to a new friend, okay? Great. I see you nodding your head. Yes. Yes. Great job saying yes. Okay, so we're going to practice with a new friend over here. So let's introduce ourselves. Great job introducing yourself to a new friend. That was super brave. Now let's ask a question. Go ahead when you're ready. What's your favorite color? My favorite color is green. Thanks for asking. What's your favorite color? Pink. Pink, that's a nice color. That was super brave of you using your full voice to ask a stranger a question and answering his response. Great job using your brave voice. So obviously that's ideal towards closer to the end, you know, when they're doing really well, they can ask all of those questions. 
had she not been able to, let's say he asked her that question and she wasn't expecting that question and she needed to answer, um, if she can answer to Allie and then Allie would slowly move closer to Mike asking the same question again as Mike and then I would turn to Mike and say, okay, Mike, ask her the question again. What's your favorite color? And then hopefully she'll be able to transfer green to Mike. That's like the shaping process. Does that make sense? Okay. Again, um, I can send you the playlist of all of the videos because um, there's definitely other things to show you. So, nor right, the eye contact's going to come later. Um, so, if, like, we notice that it's, like, a really big, it, like, if everything is down like this, then I'm going to get them responding first, and hopefully you can hear it. And then, oh, that's a little hard to hear. Why don't you go ahead and, and tilt your chin up just a little bit. We do a lot of fun stuff with stickers in order to shape. So, we may put a sticker on to the, like, if we're trying to transition from, like, mom to therapist, let's say, um, we'll put a sticker on mom's shoulder, and then we have the therapist sitting next to the, the mom, right? Hi, mom. So we're over here, and I may move the sticker down and then onto mom, or right, vice versa, right? And then put it, eventually I may put it on my chin, I may put it on my ear, I may put it on my forehead. So then it's like answer to the sticker, which also kind of takes away from them having to feel like they have to look at you straight in the eye, but they're still looking up. They're still, we, you know, we really worked hard for one girl who just was stuck. Like we could not get her to transition, but we could at least get her to answer to somebody's shoulder. So even when she meets somebody new, she's not looking at their eyes, she's, but she's talking right to, and like if you're trained in it, you'll notice it. But if you're not, she still looks like she's talking to that person. Like, who cares, right? Um, you know, she's four. Like, it doesn't matter. You know, eventually the eye contact will come and volume will come. So we tend to work on eye contact, volume, those kinds of things later. So once she's looking at, like, ear or cheek, just forget it? Like, I mean, you, you may eventually prompt toward looking over, but eventually it's going to shift mm -hmm. all on its... It yes. That's what I've seen. Yeah. Great question. Okay. Let's go back. Okay, so a few more things. So as I said before, um, you may really have to do some air traffic controlling. Um, like, okay, so you stay over there. Hold on one second. Let me give her a chance to respond. I may put them on hold. I may turn to them and have her practice with me and then go back to them and say, oh, do you mind asking that again? Most of the people I encounter are very kind, okay? Um, they will wait, especially if you have a child next to you that you're trying to help um, you know, oh, she's working on her brave talking. Do you mind asking her that question again? Or, oh, she's working on her brave talking. Do you mind asking her this question instead? Right? So instead of like, oh, well, how's it going? What are you doing these days? No. Okay. Can you ask her how old she is? Something factual, right? What her favorite color is, um, what grade she's in. Those kinds of things are much easier for these kids to answer, especially if you're trying to get something established or if like, they know they're going to see family members who they've never been able to speak to. Um, we often give parents um, a plain index card and say, come up with like your go-to questions. Like have three questions that you know your kid can answer. So then all you have to do is give that piece of paper to the other person and say, do you mind asking her these questions? She's really working on using her, on, on answering other people or using her brave voice, depending on how they respond to when you're talking about using a brave voice, okay? Um, role play, role play, role play. So really encourage the parents to also role play with the child, get those answers out, get them saying those things. The more times they do it, the easier it will be when they have to go into that. When we are working on them asking questions, sometimes that initiation is really the hardest. So we may start that question for them. So if I know her survey question is, what's your favorite color, but she's just like, can't do it, can't do it, no, I can't do that. Then I may start, how about I start the question and you finish it, what's your favorite? And she says color in front of that person. Great. They, she start. oh, I love how you finished my question. You just spoke in front of them. Okay, now let's try it where, do you want to start it yourself or do you want me to, do you want to do it? And you can even add words so that you're kind of moving backwards from the question into her being able to do the whole thing. Okay, does that make sense? So sometimes you even have to break it down like that into little baby steps. Use your reinforcement system and plan ahead. Okay? And really, um, have them make practice a part of their daily life. I have seen the most success where the parent has basically taken, and ultimately what we want to do is transfer the control over to the parent and to the teacher. 
or somebody in the school environment who can sort of champion it for them so that it's like if it's just a, a, part, a, a part of their routine, then they're going to have so much more exposure practice. And those are the kids who get better more quickly. Um, so I do have some slides on here in terms of working with teachers. Um, some of this I've already mentioned. So we will give the same chart. Um, depending upon your teacher and how much they're willing to collaborate, you have some who are amazing and you have some who say, I'm not doing any of that. Um, we, and sadly, we do see much more success with, those, with the schools that are willing to work with us and implement the system. They do better. Um, so we try to meet the teacher where they're at. If they already have a, a system in place, which a lot of teachers do, we will try to incorporate our system into their system because we know teachers don't have time to do six different systems in their class. But what we know is that these kids need more frequent reinforcement, right? So once a day at the end doesn't quite cut it initially. Eventually it will, but they need sort of that like constant like, hey, thanks for answering me. I love that I heard you from here. Give yourself a check. Oftentimes in the camps, by the time we're at like day two, these kids are giving themselves the checks. Like we're kind of monitoring it, but we trust them to give themselves the check and not like mark down 100 checks, you know. Um, so ultimately, we will just give them one of these so they can keep it in their classroom. We'll, we may even give them coins. We may have a daily report card um, that somebody had mentioned earlier where it then goes home at the end of the day and the parents give the prize. You know, some teachers can't give prizes or whatever. Um, so we really try to make sure that it's something that's going to be easy for the, the teacher to do. We will often send the link to the video training to them or do it in person. Um, as if you can get the majority of the school to attend or the specials or do an in-service training or any of those things, we try to get as many people as possible because guaranteed she's going to have a different teacher next year. She's got specials teachers. They see her in the office. So it's actually better if the more people who are aware of what to do and to not accommodate, then the better. Um, We, we do use a lot of audio and video technology to try to help transfer, transfer kind of their speech over. So if kids are really struggling to get talking in school, then we may have them record something and then either have their teacher play it aloud while they're not in the room. We give the kid the choice. Do you want it to be in the room, not be in the room? Do you want to play it? Do you want somebody else to play it? Um, so that they have some control over that, okay? Do not do this without talking to the child, okay? Um, just because they need to be ready for the response, um, which may be very different than what they've been used to. So um, the other thing that's really neat is kind of doing video splicing where you have the teacher ask questions that they might ask or something great that the kid already knows how to do and then splice it with the kid answering that question and you put them next to each other so it basically looks like the, the kid is responding directly to the teacher even though they're not in the same space. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of neat technology stuff that's going on. Um, there are some books that I have at the end of the presentation that are also good. Um, again, for some of the younger classes, you can kind of read a book. And um, I tend to like talking about every, like who feels scared, you know, everybody feels scared, right? Um, you're working on feeling brave about staying in your room at night and he she's working on using her being brave at using her voice like everybody is working on being brave at something right that's just her thing normalize it okay um, so I do have things in here about 504 plans and IEP so those recommendations that we typically provide are listed on there so you have those for your reference I'm not going to spend time going through that unless somebody has a specific question um, we do have kids who are on 504s, we have kids on IEPs, we have kids who don't have anything. Um, again, it's really about finding kind of a good, a good fit. Um, and then we do try to talk about relapse prevention, um, which you would talk about with any treatment, right? So if they are able to keep up the practice, then that's the best thing, right? So we basically have given them tools, we gave the parent tools. So we may go back and say, if they reach out and say, okay, are you doing any of your CDI time with the kids? Are you using your skills? No. Have you used your chart in a while? No. Okay, it's time to pull all of the tools back out. Let's get going, reward her again for using her voice in, in this setting. Again, it's probably gonna go faster and you can stop using it again soon, but you may have to keep it up for those bigger, those bigger tasks, okay? Um, so
So we often try to help them understand times of stress, being sick, changes in their family or school environments, changes of teachers, anything where there's a change in their routine may knock them off kind of their, kind of their, their um, process. And so sometimes you have to figure out, is there something that's getting in the way of them being successful, right? And sort of do some functional analysis and try to figure out what, what's going on, what's messing up the, the system here. Um, and hopefully they can kind of pull the tools back out and start using them at a, a kind of a higher rate again. Um, and obviously the beginning of the school year is very key for these kids. And so we do recommend, that's in the recommendations, but um, I will just mention it here, that we do recommend that they try to schedule time ahead of time with their teacher one-on-one -on -one in the classroom if they can or somewhere else um, to establish that fade in process and to be able to see the school environment um, and we really recommend them being able to do this every year. Um, even if it's just like a homeroom teacher or something before middle school, if they're still struggling with the SM at that point, um, but definitely throughout the elementary school years for every year. Yes? How do you handle funding on the new bill? <laughs> insurance or just all private pay? So right now it's all private pay. Um, and probably a majority of the places are private pay. There are some that take insurance. We have um, do private pay and then we, I do give them statements and sometimes they can get an out of network coverage for it. Um, I highly recommend that they call their insurance company ahead of time and explain sort of the intensive format and that intensive nature of it. Like when we do an intensive. Um, but otherwise, if they're coming into your office, you can bill it as a general therapy session. Um, uh, but we, we don't take insurance right now for the program. We're, we're on our way to being able to do that, um, which will be good. But so we, and we've had many conversations with insurance companies about why they need this treatment, why they came here, why la la la. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I, I have, sadly, I don't have a magic answer um, yet. And then this summer, we're actually, um, which I haven't had a chance to get to, we're, we're gonna be doing a randomized control trial this summer. Um, where the kids are being randomized either to treatment or to wait list. Um, so that means if they get randomized to treatment, they basically get the camp in June. And if they get wait list, then they get the camp in July. Um, and they're gonna get a 60 to 90% discount on their, their cost. So that's our way of being able to at least offer. And we've been using a sliding scale for the past several years because I feel horrible making anyone pay to do any of this. So. Um, uh, so the study is really going to be a nice way to be able to get families in who can't afford like the full, the full fee for the, at least the intensive work. But um, FIU has doctoral students and master students where we offer a sliding scale fee as well. So, um, but yeah, that's a good question. The insurance is always a kind of a pain. Um, okay, so very quickly. Um, we have had pretty good success with our, with our programs. Um, we had good response rates. Again, unfortunately, not everybody, uh, which is pretty standard across any RCT or CBT treatment. We see 60 to 70% um, response, and we're, we were at about 78%, um, with 35 of them being excellent responders on like a CGI status. Um, you can see that within the SMQ, um, the home went up. You can see that everything went up post-treatment. Um, hold on. I'm trying to go quickly. Um, <laughs> this is taking a long time. The scared, you can see. So on the scared anxiety, there's one where it's an anxiety diagnosis and specifically the social um, diagnosis, social anxiety diagnosis. You can see that it went down and, and that was actually significant. Um, and then we actually created a different behavioral measure because I was saying the SMQ was kind of hard to see behavior change from Monday to Friday. Um, so we actually created this thing called the voice, um, the verbal output during interactions in the classroom environment. Um, and we give them certain prompts where their counselors are not allowed to jump in and help them to see how they're able to respond to us um, in the classroom setting in the morning. So we would do the morning meeting, and then we would do the treasure chest at the end where they have to give us, we ask how many coins they earned, and then they have to tell us what prize they got. Um, and so what you can see here is that the rate of responding within one prompt um, went up significantly between day one and day five, um, which is great. Um, 
so they got faster. And then the type of responding, um, actually, um, even though the numbers are small, it was significant in terms of the type of responding, um, in terms of was it um, nonverbal up to verbal. So the higher the number, the more verbal they were. Um, so that went up as well. So we're, we have more data um, that we're trying to look at, but parents seem to be pretty happy with it. Um, so like I said, uh, for the summer, we're doing the randomized control trial. If anybody uh, is interested in discussing that, I'm happy to talk to you further about it. Um, and so, which is really nice, because right now we don't have an RCT on the intensive format for kids with SM. So this is going to be the first one. We're really excited. Um, and hopefully then we can actually get some official data out there besides just case studies um, on the intensive format. So um, obviously my ideal world, I'd get to like compare the individual versus the intensive treatment, but that's down the road if I get funding. Um, and uh, so really just trying to understand also the language component, especially down here in Miami and how that impacts their, their ability kind of moving forward. And last, um, we have a randomized control trial looking at an internet delivered. Um, it's called coping and, and um, co coaching approach behavior and learning through modeling, um, which is a mouthful. But it's basically PCIT um, for kids with anxiety more generally. So social anxiety, GAD, separation, anything. But there are also are a lot of kids will, who will have had an SM who are going to be getting this treatment. And um, we deliver it basically in our office to their home. Um, and we're doing live coaching through the internet. Um, so I did give you some books and some resources. And um, I had told somebody at the end that I was going to mention something. So selectivemutism.org. If you see patients, if you are interested, I highly recommend come, become a member of SMG or just know that that, or it's now SMA, Selective Mutism Association. It's really helpful. Um, I'm on the board of directors, but I promoted it even when I wasn't because it's a it's just an advocacy group. It basically there's a Facebook page for parents. There are a ton of resources. If you're looking for somebody to help provide treatment in an area, um, there every treating professional that we know of who has some SM experience is listed in that list of treating professionals on that page. They sell books. We have a conference every year that has a professional track and a parent track. So families can come um, as well. It's going to be in Boston this coming uh, October. Um, so I highly recommend um, even just checking the website out because it should give you some information. And it has a ton of other resources on it if you're looking for IEP recommendations or other things like that. Um, and then. I do have to thank everybody who has ever helped me run one of these teams. Um, this was our costume day or something, I think the last day of the week of the camp. But um, so, and I want to thank all of you. And here's my contact information. Feel free to send me an email. Um, if I don't get back to you within a couple days, please e just email me again. Um, as you probably all get, you get too many, and it's hard to remember what you have and have not responded to. So um, I think I finished two minutes over. I was so close. Um, but I really want to thank you all for all of your great questions and your participation. So um, feel free to ask any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.